Without further ado, we shall move to this, this um, pillar of, of uh, preventing IUU uh, that will be incorporated in the guidelines for state measures. Next slide, please. And the first presentation that we have today is by Charlene Godengoza. Charlene is the Director of International Development at Cofresh. Um, she is leading this, this project um, of AFD, uh, supporting the IORA, the IORA uh, Secretariat. Prior and her, her title, her uh, presentation is Assessment of the Capacity Needs Required and the Current Level of Implementation of Fort State Measures in the IORA region. Now, this is based on a review that was done last year. In fact, this is one of the reviews that uh, helps start us across this whole process. Now, Charlene, before joining Kofrapesh, <coughs> sorry, worked for the interna for international organizations such as the EU, FAO, RFMOs, but also has consulting experience with NGOs, CG, IUCN. Since 2020, she acts as the project director of the AFD technical assistance to the Indian Ocean Rim Association, IORA. Uh, and in this context, she contributed to this, to this uh, assessment, uh, looking at the situation across the Indian Ocean. Uh, so without further ado, let me uh, ask Charlene to proceed with her presentation. Charlene, please proceed. Thank you very much, Ombre. So um, this is the first slide of my presentation, so I don't have to introduce myself again because Ombre just uh, did it very well and thoroughly. So this is the title of my presentation. And as Obra mentioned it, uh, it is a presentation of the technical report that was produced with the following title. So what is the content of my presentation? So I will uh, briefly present you uh, the context of the report very, very briefly because Obra already explained it. Then I will introduce the structure and methodology adopted for the report. Then I will make a very brief uh, update on the status of ratification and implementation of the FAFBSMA in the IORA region. I will also present uh, the result from the basic capacity needs assessment that was undertaken in the context of this uh, study. I will present the main uh, results of the study and the key findings. And then I will uh, present the recommendation that emerged from the report and finding for the IORA IU guidelines. So as we mentioned it already, uh, the AFD is providing a technical assistance to the IORA for the implementation of the Blue Economy Working Group Work Plan with a special focus on fisheries, aquaculture, and marine environment. So there is a series of, of objectives in the context of this work plan, and one of them is to combat IE fishing in the IORA region. So in the plan, we have several activities that were planned, and uh, there were some uh, short-term uh, activity that were uh, planned uh, with a, a specific timeline. And one of the activities was to conduct an assessment of the capacity needs required human and institutional in the current level of implementation of core state measure in the IORA region. So what is the content of the report? Maybe that then you, you, you feel like downloading it and reading it. Uh, so first there is an introduction and methodology, methodology about how we approach the, the study. There is a presentation of the fishing port in the IORA region with uh, showing some important figures and data about uh, the main fishing ports in the Indian Ocean with activity of foreign fishing vessel, with key uh, figures and information 
about those important parts, such as number of calls and uh, transshipments, quantities of catches and landings. And this mainly rely on RFMO's uh, data and information available. So the second section of the content of the report is on the PSMA, and it provides a status of ratification and implementation in the IORA region. Then there is a chapter on port state measure adopted by regional fisheries management organization in the IOA region. There is a great focus in this analysis on IOTC because 90% of the IORA member states are also a contracting party to uh, the IOTC. There is also analysis of the port state measure resolution adopted by CCBST and uh, COPA. Then there is the analysis of the result of this questionnaire that was circulated to the member state to, us to do this very capacity, basic capacity needs and then emerging trend conclusion and recommendation. So the methodology adopted to the report, of course, we were not able to undertake a 22 uh, field mission in those IORA member states that were covered at the time. So France was excluded of the report at the time because it was not yet a uh, member. Uh, of the IORA, and this is why France is not uh, covered by this report. So the assessment relies mainly on, as indicated, publicly available information on port state measure, including FAO and RFMOs, and a questionnaire that was uh, developed by Herrick uh, in the context and Pew in the context of this report, which is shown here, that we would uh, invite you to, to read, and that was sent to the 22 IORA member states. So the questionnaire, some interesting fact about the questionnaire. So uh, the level of response was around 36%, although we aimed at uh, 50% to have half of the IORA member states uh, providing a reply. We had, we had eight IORA member states out of 22, and we gave uh, four months to give answer to 16 questions uh, in total. So last time when I did this uh, presentation in our uh, IEU webinar in September 2021. The FAO was giving uh, a presentation on the status of ratification, so this is why I excluded from my presentation, but now I just wanted to give very, very uh, brief facts and overview on, on the situation. So we have now, I checked like three days ago, 70 uh, countries that are party to the port state measure agreement. And among the 23 IOR member states, we have uh, only uh, 15 uh, countries that are party to the PSMA. And this represents 65% of IOR member states. So uh, this is our this is a table I included in my uh, report. So the information are provided by FAO and I found them on the FAO uh, database. And this is on the designated port and contact port. Now, exchange of information and communication of information is a key provision of the PSMA. And as we can see here, we see the party to the PSMA and we see when information were provided to national focal points and on national focal point and on list of designated board. And as you can see, unfortunately, there is a lot of no information available. Now, that was at the time of 2021. So maybe uh, there have been some improvement on that side. And this was recognized at the last uh, parties of the PSMA. So this is as well uh, a table that I compiled from an analysis of the questionnaire that was done in 2020 by FAO on the implementation of the Code of Conduct on Fisheries. And as we can see here, uh, the rating was one to five, five being the highest score. We can see that Africa and Asia, half of the member are IRA member states. And we can see that there is still space for some improvement regarding operation and procedure, institutional framework and legislation. So this is also a table extracted from my report that I made a brief legal analysis. There is an annex with a more thorough analysis of legal, legal provision existing in national legislation. So this was partially based on the FAO checklist. So as we can see, there is Article 7 to 10, which is about entry into port, then Article 11 on use of port, then um, Article 12 to 18 on port inspection and follow-up. So as well, I made an analysis of all the available and current legislation of the IORA member states. 
indicating if they were a party or not. And I looked if I could identify some provision that reflected even partially I tick the box because some country here you can see that there are some crosses, but sometimes the uh, provision of the PSMA were only partially uh, transposed. So now regarding our questionnaire, so half of the question were about uh, the activity and the, the port, the activity of foreign fish investment in the port and PSMA in place in the country, and the rest were about to try to identify the capacity needs. Very basic, as I said, 16 questions. So some trends about the questionnaire. So in the answer we received, 100% answer that there is a form of cooperation between agency, 100% of the respondent require foreign fishing investment to provide information, 100% refuse the use of force to investment in case of IEU fishing suspicion, 100% consider that government are supportive of FCS activity, 75% consider that foreign fishing investment in the EZ is a potential issue, but only 75 so that PSM is effective against IEU fishing. So here you can see how you would describe the human capacity of your country to carry out port inspection as adequate or inadequate. This is a very interesting result. 88% consider it is inadequate. When we ask what is the reason why you consider your capacity uh, inadequate, seven countries out of the eight said that it's a problem of lack of training, but also of insufficient port um, inspector available at port but also some problem with adequate legal regime. Again, when we ask what are the most important constraints in relation with human capacity, the lack of training comes again, the lack of manpower and inspector, the problem of language barrier and communication as well was mentioned, and also some problem on uh, working condition and financial constraint. So we asked the country to provide some, uh, you know, fit for thought on how we could improve the capacity. And uh, again, there were some proposals made on training, different kind of training. And what was interesting as well was the proposal of SESHA to have minimum regional operational standard for implementing uh, PSNA, which is partially covered by IOTC. So the meeting trends uh, and conclusion, of course, you can find more in the report, but basically is that yes, more than half of the IOR member states are party to the FAO PSMA, but still eight IOR member states have not ratified their agreement. And this includes some countries with some important foreign fishing activity, like, uh, for example, Singapore, but also Malaysia and uh, Tanzania. The implementation of the PSMA Vous avez coupé votre micro. And CPC. So sorry, I just have to quickly uh, stop that. We, we need to stop the mic of someone. Participants. Yeah. Done. Magic of technology. Uh, wait, I just remember that. So, the five yeah, I'm done. So, oh, it's just now the, the, the proposal for the guideline. So, uh, so still an implementation which is partial, requiring more effort and commitment in terms of exchange of information and also consistency with the information exchange with FO and the FO. Because sometimes we saw that some uh, information are communicated to some RFMO, not to the FAO, not to the other RFMO, so there is progress to do on that. However, you will see that yes, the IOR member state and RFMO CPC, and especially for the IOTC, made great progress in complying with uh, port state measure resolution. You will see that in the presentation coming after my uh, of Florian Giraud from the IOTC. However, countries are still struggling to comply, and this is why Florian will present it and it's uh, concern the obligation to report inspection report, but also the 5% threshold to monitor lending and transshipment. So although um, also IORA member states have adopted some national plan of action of IU, many countries still have issue in addressing IU fishing as a problem requiring interagency cooperation. 
Also, I have noticed that there are a few cases of denial of entry into port. This is a core provision of the FAO PSMA. And however, for example, for the IOTC, only 12 uh, were reported over the past four years. And the lack of training is the main constraint identified by IRA member state in relation to human capacity for the implementation of the PSMA agreement. So the recommendation for the future uh, guideline, uh, we will discuss that in the group that I will moderate on four step measure. But basically, uh, the proposal coming up were consider ratifying the FAOPC SMA. This is, of course, for the member states that are not yet party to the agreement. Adopt or revise national legislation to fully comply with key provision of the PSMA and avoid partial translation into the national system. Commit to improve compliance with the reporting requirements and other obligation of the FAO PSMA and a referral uh, resolution on port state measure and CMM. Ensure coherency among the PSM information communicated to the different area from involved and the FAO. Improve reporting quality in the context of the RFMO PSM and resolution as necessary, because sometimes the RFMO that just look compliance in terms of okay, information were provided, but they don't look at the quality of the information. They only look at okay, the reporting was uh, fulfilled and they provided information, but not looking at the quality. Finally, consider mechanism for strengthening capacity on inspection and reporting to improve PSM application in the IORA region. Promote the exchange of information by member states through existing electronic system and database, such as the EPSM and FO database. And Florian will cover the EPSM from IOTC after. Advocate an integrated approach to combat IU fishing in the Indian Ocean. And this is linked. Support interagency cooperation through the adoption of formal cooperation mechanisms such as MOU, for example. The IOTC have great tools and also models of MOU that can be used. So how to get the report? Uh, last year during the webinar, it was not available, but now you can download it on the IORA uh, website. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Charlene. Thank you very much for this presentation and uh, setting the scene in, in this situation. And it's it's good to see that uh, the report is now available. I would uh, I would uh, recommend that you do look at this. It covers the entire Indian Ocean. There is a lot of information in the report, and Charlene has had to very briefly and rapidly cover it. So. I would uh, I would recommend that you that you uh, take access that report and see some of the status of PSMA in the countries of the Iowa region. And as mentioned, of course, um, it follows very much along the IOTC um, reporting scheme and the IOTC system because it may be a CT, IOCT uh, mandate because. Um, um, Ninety percent of the of the members of IORA are members are uh, contracting parties of IOTC. So thank you very much. Now, <clears throat> what we do is at the end of a session of three presentations, we then have um, we have participants quiz the. The three presentations. So there'll be a, a discussion period and a, a polling exercise um, for the three presentations. But, um, Sage, what's the next slide? It's the where you come from, what's the country? Yes, uh, okay. Are you going to put that up? Or? But what we'd like to do. I'm just. What we'd like to do now is since uh, people, since we've had a, a 20 minutes of start and people are, are settled in, we'd, we'd like to have a little poll because what we'd like to do is find out a bit more about, about you, where you come from uh, in the Iowa region and, and uh, what is your function or what section of, of uh, of institutions or government or NGOs uh, you are 
party to or is your involvement. So what we shall be doing is using Mentimeter. And those, those that were present yesterday will certainly know about it. What you do is you take your tablet and you or mobile and you go to www.mentimeter.com and you put in a code. Can we have that? And the code, the code, can we have the... It's on the chat. It's on the chat. Yes. So what has happened is our IT person, Sej, has sent you uh, in the chat the code that you will use in order to access this polling. And it, the code is also on the screen, 49712235. So we would invite you to go to www.mentimeter.com and enter that code. Can we proceed, uh, Sam? Okay, and if you do that, you will see the question that you are seeing on the screen. Where are you working? What area are you working across the Indian Ocean? Is it in international organizations, private sector, government institutions, other? And as you can see, uh, we have an interactive polling session, kindly done by Mentimeter. And now you can see the participation, participation of, of this group uh, today. At this time, we have a total of how, how many participants? 12. We've got 12 participants. We've got 12 people who have entered, but I'm sure we have more than 43 participants. We have, okay. At the moment, uh, there are 43 participants. And we would like to encourage you to proceed to www.menti.com and use the code 497-12235 that you can see in the screen. Proceed to do that on your, your mobile or your laptop so that we get an indication of where you are working uh, across the Indian Ocean. Please, uh, I would encourage you to do that. At the moment, we've got 22, and we have also, at the same time, over 40 participants. So we'll give you a, a, a minute or two to do this. <laughs> And should you have any issue to access this, just send a, a question in the chat box. Just send a question in the chat box and we'll seek to uh, resolve it. So if there are any issues, you can send it. We're not changing very much from now. How much? How many? 26. We have 26, 26 uh, persons or participants. That That's very similar to yesterday. Okay, good. Thank you very much. We'll move to another one. Just hang in there, those who are participating, and answer this question. From which country are you joining us? And as you enter, we'll be able to see, we'll be able to get a, an appreciation of who are the, from what, which countries you are joining us and give us an idea of, of the participation at this workshop. And others who may not have, have used Mentimeter uh, the odd 20 odd, if you have any problems, if it is a, a, any constriction that we can help, just send a message in the chat box and Serge, our IT guru, will, will uh, seek to resolve it. 
the next um, presentation. Our next person who will be joining us is uh, Monsieur, uh, Mr. Um, Monsieur, Mr. Florian Giroux. Florian Giroux of the IOTC. Now, Florian, I, and I'm sure, in fact, I'm sure most of you will know Florian Giroux since he's been in IOTC for quite a while. Florian joined IOTC uh, in April 2012. He's currently the um, compliance coordinator. He's earned his Masters of Exploration in Coastal Living Resources and Aquaculture in France. Um, he's worked in South Africa I know, for many years, he has, since 19, 1998. Uh, He's been in the compliance section and across uh, many countries of the Western Indian Ocean for years. Um, and in, in the uh, IOTC, he is tasked with working very closely with the members and cooperating non-contracting parties of the commission to ensure the highest level of compliance with conservation and management measures adopted by the commission. Now, uh, Florian will be presenting his presentation is implementation of port state measures in the IOTC context. Florian, welcome, and please proceed with your presentation. Yes, good morning, uh, Aubrey, and uh, good morning, uh, everyone. So bear with me, I'm going to share the share the presentation um, but they still uh, yeah okay I can proceed now so can you see the presentation yes, no, no, we can see the we can see the presentation thank you just have to put in the slide you you have to put it in the slideshow. I mean, yes, that's right. That's it. Is that, is that better? Much better. Loud and clear. Okay, great. Um, so I'm going to start with uh, a little bit of uh, history, huh, as uh, IOTC has an history in terms of uh, post state measures, and this has started in 2001 huh, with the. Uh, uh, a workshop uh, on an integrated control and inspection scheme in uh, Japan. Further to that, uh, in 2002, uh, the IOTC adopted the uh, resolution 0201 that related to the establishment of an uh, IOTC port uh, program of uh, inspection in port, which is now resolution 0503. Uh, in 2009, uh, the year that the FAO PSMA was uh, finalized, the text of the uh, uh, agreement, uh, there was a proposal for a resolution in IOTC on post-state measures huh, uh, to prevent, detain, and eliminate uh, IEU fishing. And then in uh, 2010, uh, this uh, resolution was uh, adopted. And then in 2016, uh, this resolution was uh, uh, revised and uh, uh, integrating a, a tool that is specific to uh, uh, the implementation of uh, post state measures, the uh, electronic post state measures application. So in brief, the resolution 1611, uh, the provision is almost identical to the FAO PSMA. Uh, the implementation is uh, conducted in the context of the uh, mandate of the IOTC, uh, the tuna fisheries and applying to uh, tuna fishing vessel and uh, vessel that are operating in the IOTC area of competencies. Uh, in 2010, 12, uh, it lasted two uh, years, uh, we developed uh, a specific uh, PSM training package that uh, uh, I will present later on. 
And uh, in 2013, we started the development of the uh, EPSM application. Um, and finally, the EPSM application after its development uh, was operational in uh, May 2016. So this is the months and year the application entered into production and uh, uh, IOTC members started to use this uh, application to implement uh, post-state measures. Um, so there are a series of uh, PSM uh, capacity uh, building activity for IOTC. We develop uh, six uh, items in terms of uh, capacity building. The first one relates to uh, legal and uh, capacity assessment of poor state CPC uh, of IOTC. We develop national PSM training. They are available on the uh, website of the IOTC on the uh, poor state measures page. And this training uh, was initially uh, conducted over uh, five days uh, classes. And then we proceed with a follow-up training every year with uh, the members that are posted, uh, IUTC posted. Um, then we develop regional PSM training on uh, national interagency collaboration and regional cooperation. Uh, as well, uh, this training is uh, uh, available on the uh, IOTC website. Um, we develop a uh, regional PSM training uh, on a specific uh, requirement of the uh, PSM resolution, which is the uh, monitoring of lending and transshipment in port. Again, this training is available on the IOTC website. Uh, the link is provided uh, on the screen. Um, and then training uh, in the use of the uh, EPSM application, training of uh, five days uh, uh, for the members and follow-up training uh, every year uh, uh, to those that are using the uh, EPSM application. We provided as well legal assistance to uh, members to facilitate the implementation of the uh, resolution. This uh, in the context of the uh, um, obligation for um, IOTC member state to transpose uh, IOTC resolution into their national uh, domestic uh, legislation. Um, for legal and capacity assessment of process CPC, um, so we have a, a series of activity. We identify the training need at several level, policy, uh, planning, legal, uh, institutional, governance, operational, and uh, human uh, resources capacity. This uh, with the objective to uh, strengthen the implementation of the resolution. Uh, the methodology was simple, huh? country visit, questionnaire, and workshop with the members. And we produce uh, two uh, core material, um, uh, legal and capacity assessment of uh, readiness to implement the uh, PSMR and a guideline for strengthening the implementation of the IOTC uh, resolution. Uh, with regard to the national training uh, of uh, official in uh, uh, PSM implementation at uh, administrative and operational level, uh, this was training uh, in the country. Uh, uh, so secretariat uh, uh, visiting country and working with the, 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 the official that uh, were in charge of uh, PSM implementation. And for this national uh, PSM training, we produce uh, some material, uh, full curriculum and training program, uh, manual on the procedure for the implementation of the IOTC PSM, which is now available uh, uh, on the uh, IOTC website. Uh, species uh, identif identification guide for fisheries inspectors. This is in the context of the, the requirement to um, to monitor the landing and uh, transshipment of uh, uh, foreign vessel uh, in a port. Uh, we provided the translation guide and IOTC PSM uh, notebook for uh, fisheries inspectors. And we provided as well an inspector kit and a series of leaflets uh, to raise uh, awareness about the requirement of uh, implementation. So uh, this training was delivered to uh, 15 post set members over two years. And uh, after this uh, period of two years, we conducted uh, 
follow-up training and uh, uh, continued assistance to uh, to the members, uh, which is still ongoing. Uh, Uh, regional training on national interagency collaboration and regional cooperation, which is an important aspect of the uh, uh, implementation of the resolution and uh, to uh, effectively reach the objective of the resolution the, to combat IU fishing. So again, uh, we train uh, official in PSM implementation and uh, all the requirements of uh, collaboration and cooperation uh, uh, for the resolution. So this was training in class, and uh, we produced a series of material, uh, model uh, MOU, uh, Memorandum of Understanding on National Interagency Collaboration and Regional uh, Cooperation, a guideline on best practice, uh, and a series of leaflets uh, for uh, awareness purpose for the uh, implementation of this uh, specific requirement. So we delivered this training to uh, the 15 uh, posted members of the IUTC. Uh, regional training on uh, monitoring landing and uh, transshipment in port. Um, uh, this is in the context of the uh, requirement to uh, uh, monitor landing or transshipment in port uh, of foreign fishing vessel and this is to comply with the 5% monitoring requirement of uh, uh, landing and transshipment. So we produced again a, a series of material for this uh, regional training, uh, the PSM procedures uh, of IUTC for the implementation of the resolution and species identification guide for fishery inspectors. We conducted this training uh, uh, for uh, 10 uh, IUTC uh, board state members. And again, we uh, provide follow-up training practices in port uh, uh, that uh, lasted uh, five days for a series of country like uh, Mauritius, Seychelles, South Africa, and Madagascar. Excuse me, uh, Florian, we've got five yes. minutes left. Thank you. Oh. Uh, then legal assistance. Huh? We uh, uh, provided uh, core material, which is a PSM uh, legislative uh, template in uh, English, French, and Portuguese. So the member have uh, a better uh, um, a better idea how to uh, translate the resolution into their uh, domestic legislation. Uh, so we have uh, in IOTC a comprehensive set of uh, manuals, guide, and documents to facilitate the uh, implementation of the uh, post-state measure resolution. Uh, we have been uh, going through the procedure, the uh, fish ID guide, the uh, uh, language guide, uh, the guideline for uh, best practice on uh, interagency uh, and regional cooperation. Then the EPSM application. EPSM application was uh, developed as a, a system to implement the post-state measures and train the industry, mostly the agent and the post-state competent authority in the use of the application. So there have been development period for this application and in-country training for the 17, uh, uh, the uh, uh, 15 post-state members. It uh, last uh, three years development for the application to go, and uh, uh, we develop uh, four manuals to uh, assist in the use in the uh, the use of the EPSM. Uh, EPSM is an operational tool, and uh, where we are uh, now, um, we are still improving the application and debug uh, as well uh, is uh, still ongoing with the with the members. Uh, uh, specific uh, attention is that uh, the uh, application is used by uh, South Africa and Thailand in the context of the PSMA. And uh, since five years, the application is in use. Huh? We had uh, more than 10,000 vessel file and port call with the, within the PSM, more than uh, 22,000 forms, PSM forms submitted, uh, 4,000 uh, inspection report uh, submitted through the system. Uh, so, uh, and, and there have been uh, more than 400 uh, individual from uh, 14 IOTC member states, both state official and industry that have been trained in the use of EPSM. 
and the application is being used by 43 flag states, 16 IoT support states, and more than 2,500 uh, vessels uh, representative. Uh, obviously, the uh, EPSM application has uh, uh, it's an operational tool huh, to implement uh, PSM. Uh, it could be extended. There have been some discussion with ICAT huh, to uh, extend the EPSM to ICAT. Uh, they, we are discussing with FAO as there is a, to make a link with the uh, FAO uh, uh, PSM uh, global system. Uh, and then we have uh, also already a uh, training module uh, for EPSM reporting where uh, member can extract all PSM data and uh, uh, generate report uh, on uh, posted measures implementation. So at the bottom of the screen, you can see the, the, this module three that uh, allow the members to uh, use their data and uh, make their report on posted measures. And um, well, uh, the PSM application will uh, have soon a new tool. Huh? We have developed uh, um, uh, inspection report uh, uh, offline huh? that uh, CPC will be able to use uh, on board the vessel and make offline inspection uh, for report completion. Uh, this is a tablet PC based uh, inspection report and uh, delivery is expected in 2022 and training plan over the year 2022. So this will uh, greatly facilitate the work of the inspectors uh, to, uh, to implement and to, uh, to comply with the requirement of the resolution. Um, so lesson, lesson learned uh, from the, uh, all those uh, capacity building, building activity and development. Um, so there have been progress in implementation um, I would like to say thanks to the capacity building assistance, which is uh, something that is still ongoing. Uh, thanks to the EPSM application. Uh, it's not only a tool to, um, to implement PSM, huh? it's a tool to, uh, to, uh, to uh, strengthen the understanding of the uh, uh, members to uh, post that measures as well. Huh? Uh, there have been improvements in legal PSM framework. Uh, there have been a process of uh, institutionalization of post-set measures and uh, restructuring of some uh, MCS administration, uh, dedicated uh, PSM unit and only PSM focusing on post-set measures for some post-set. And uh, this assistance is, uh, uh, has been designed uh, as a long-term plan for uh, IOTC. Thank you. Aubrey, I'm um, available if there are any questions. Thank, thank you very much, Floria. Thank you very much for that and uh, uh, covering the significant capacity building that IOTC has been doing to its members on PSM, uh, on its PSM resolutions, uh, implementing them. I'm interesting to see the, the developments going on with your extension or possible extension or cooperation with ICAT and the, the developments in the EPSM. Yesterday, we raised a, a discussion or a matter on a super CDS, some things uh, like a super uh, catch documentation scheme, something that extends across globally, across all tuna management, uh, fisheries management organizations, and perhaps um, uh, in due course, we should be looking at a super CDS. So thank you very much. Questions will come. Um, Floria at the end of the session. And now I have the, the, the honor of, of inviting another colleague and uh, well-known character in the region, um, Per Eric Berg. Um, I think certainly in the Western Indian Ocean, not Perry does not need much introduction. He has more than 30 years of experience, hands-on experience with international maritime and fisheries enforcement operations. Um, his main area of interest is researching and implementing MCS systems that function within the limitations of developing country situations, very important. 
Because sometimes we have very sophisticated things that do not transfer to developing country situations. He was one of the founding members of Stop Illegal Fishing and heads up the Stop Illegal Fishing Fisheries Investigative Unit. Per Eric will be presenting on implementing the PSMA in the Western Indian Ocean implementation, cooperation, and challenges. Per Eric, welcome and please proceed. Thank you, Aubrey. I will try to get up my presentation here. Let's see. Are you able to see this one? Yes. yes. And now it's on slide mode. It's on presentation mode. Fantastic. Okay. Is this working? Is yes. it still? So, okay. Thank you. So thank you, Aubrey, and uh, thank you, Tiora, for allowing me to speak today. I will talk about the experiences related to particularly three projects um, that we have been implementing in uh, the Western Indian Ocean in particular. It is the um, GIZ-funded um, um, PSM to stop illegal fishing project, which was a five-year program implementing PSM in Ghana, Madagascar, and Mozambique. I will look at some of the experiences from Fish Eye Africa, uh, which had quite a lot of initiative in, with partners in the Western Indian Ocean, and also lately uh, cooperation with Nelson Mandela University, the Fish Force program, uh, which do capacity building in South Africa, Kenya, Mozambique, and Tanzania at the moment. Um, I will focus on the Western Indian Ocean and in general terms, and I will probably jump a bit around to get my points across. Um, the challenges has changed uh, in the last two decades and become quite different. If you look at the threats and drivers are now far more external, and I think beyond the reach or the arm of fisheries managers. And this includes a growing demand for fish and seafood. We see climate change, we see harm from subsidies, we have blue expectations and illegal fishing and fisheries crime. And of course, on top of this, we also got the corona pandemic. And the need to control and have overview of activities in ports is one way to deal with the new challenges and protect the blue economy of the Indian Ocean. Um, an interesting comparative capacity analysis that is just done um, with the PRSP program. Um, capacity is improving and the gap between the countries, particularly those that were lagging behind 10 years ago, is getting smaller. And we see that particularly institutional capacity has improved quite a lot, not least, I think, because of new and better legislation coming into force in many of the countries. Human capacity is also improving, but probably a bit slower, while the biggest problem at the moment is probably the infrastructure capacity, which is weak in many countries. But overall, this shows that all the different initiatives and capacity building projects that has been ongoing, is they are all been successful. Um, and I think Jill will be pleased to see that this corresponds quite well with the IUU index that was issued last year. Uh, ports are important. Um, many countries have limited access to expensive surveillance platforms, such as patrol vessels or patrol planes. And making port state measures uh, in combination with technology and possibly observers probably is the most effective tool for MCS in the region. New technologies, such as use of drones and unmanned surface vehicles, may further contribute to an improved and less costly solution in the coming years. And preventing illegal catches from being landed is an important objective to increase compliance in fisheries and essential in the development of the blue economy. It protects legal markets and legal operators, which is fundamentally important in this context. And of course, in a wider system of port controls, working together across agencies to ensure adequate skills and powers is also fundamental for port size measures. Um, and not least in context of fisheries crimes and violations related to safety and working conditions on board fishing vessels. A quick look at the tuna fishery in the Indian Ocean, because I know it's important for everybody present. 
And it's a very important species and most important commercial species. And if you look at the figures, we can see that almost 32% is caught by purseiners and 8% by industrial longliners, which is probably the most common foreign fish the vessel types most countries are familiar with. Looking at the different species, not least yellowfin tuna that is in the red, the main catch by a foreign fishing vessel is really conducted by the industrial person fishery. And this brings some interesting uh, observations. Um, can PSM assist coastal states to ensure sustainability of the yellowfin tuna? Roughly, we see that one part is transshipped at sea, three parts landed in ports, and six parts are transshipped in ports into carriers and containers destined for the global market. When we look at transshipment monitoring, uh, we can see a huge challenge that links to the implementation of port state measures. Considering what we know about the different vessel types, the monitoring of transshipment and landing, the fact that yellowfin tuna is threatened, we believe this is an issue where improved port state measures could make significant difference. The Indian Ocean Regional Observer Program is the most effective MCS tool for monitoring transshipment in the Western Indian Ocean with 100% coverage of at sea transshipments. But only 5% of the port transshipments landings are monitored. And the big question is in port transshipment for transit. Is anything monitored at all? This is a challenge for the region that links to implementation of port state measures, how to monitor transshipments and landings in port better. And not least, who should pay for this, considering the regional observer program is financed by the flag states. I'm sure you have seen these type of PSMA flowcharts before. I just want to pull out two issues from this figure. Um, the AREP uh, should be assessed at the earliest time prior to the proposed port entry to determine the level of risk associated with the vessel. The AREP and later an inspection of the vessel may expose suspicions of sufficient proof of IUU. This stage is where we mostly focus our effort to facilitate an informed decision related to port access, port services, and not. I will also mention the term sufficient proof of IU fishing, as this will depend upon the jurisdiction where the vessel is calling port. This makes it difficult to create regional SOPs for port inspections and risk assessment, as they will rather be guidelines based upon best practice, because all of this will have to be adopted for each country and the national legislation. Then I will look at four lessons learned, which we found during our work and the projects we've been attached to. And I will start with the AREP, which I mentioned. The vital first step is the complete AREP, the risk assessment, and then the informed decision related to port access. To establish a system where an AREP is received, a risk assessment is performed, and a decision is made within 24 to 72 hours is a challenge. But it is the first step of implementing port state measure. And if this does not happen, we are not getting on with the implementation of the PSMR or the PSMA. We see that in many countries, the ADEP is not received or the port entry request, which is used by the port authority, is used in the ADEP. But there is very limited fisheries information in relation to do this. And we also see that very few countries do a risk assessment leading to an informed decision to grant port access with or without port services or not. Uh, there are also examples of un coordinated approaches with the port authorities, which makes it very difficult for fisheries authorities to deny port access or port services. And as um, uh, Florian explained, the IOTC EPSM offer an excellent solution that could support countries um, tremendously, but it is not fully utilized as many countries are not using it as intended. The regional cooperation is another uh, very important uh, part of in implementing the pay port state measures. Uh, and this is needed to maximize the effect and impact of the work. This has improved immensely over the last 10 years, but it needs to become even better. And the more we cooperate and share information, the more difficult it becomes to be an illegal vessel operator or vessel owner. There are various steps or stages in this, all going from acting alone into full collaboration. Uh, and in the region, to curb IUU fishing and fisheries crime, 
port state measure efficiency is dependent on the regional cooperation and information sharing. This has been a trend in the last 10 years, and it's been um, a tremendous uh, progress. Uh, it has been anchored in IOTC, SYOFC, IOC, Fisheye Africa Task Force, and now recently in the SADC MCS Coordination Center. Depending on the issues at hand, the region has moved from acting alone to coordination and cooperation. We now need to aim for true collaboration in the future and see this materialized through, um, through uh, operations. Excuse me, uh, Eric, you've got five minutes to go. Thank you. Th thank you. Interagency cooperation and operations, creating platform for cooperation with different agencies is not easy. Different priorities, cultures, and mandates will require a formal structure, but interagency cooperation is essential if you want to succeed with an efficient port control system, and the cooperation will make everybody stronger. Ports are often under the control of port and maritime authorities, and they need to be on board. Powers of inspectors vary, and wider cooperation may be required to fulfill regional and international requirements. PSM capacity building must include all these relevant agencies to make sure we get all, uh, all agencies on board. We have seen many instances of crimes being linked to fishing industry. Uh, safety violations, human abuse, maybe being the most common ones, but also corruption, wildlife and drug smuggling are common issues. Ports offer an opportunity to prevent these crimes through interagency cooperation and using shared powers and mandate. The vessel on the photo shows an Iranian fishing doe moving all the way from the Arabian Gulf, where it was first detected, to Tanzania via the Comoros and Mozambique in June 2021. It was eventually arrested with more than 1,000 kilos of heroin, worth more than 150 million US dollars. This was probably aimed at fueling the unrest in northern Mozambique. Fisheries crimes threaten maritime security in the region, and port state measures can make a difference in this. Based on more than 50 cases in Fisheye Africa, we found illegal fishing to be part of a complex, systematic, planned web of crimes designed to increase profit from the fishing sector. The result is rather alarming, showing a complex pyramid turned upside down in the Western Indian Ocean, meaning that 80% of all cases included deliberate non-compliance and associated crime detected. This shows that the issue we are dealing with is larger than only fisheries and how important it is to establish effective interagency cooperation. Um, I also want to mention corruption, as corruption is another issue that facilitates IUU and fisheries crimes. We need to reduce the opportunities for corruption. Uh, we analyzed 20 IUU fishing cases in 2020 to look at corruption, and we found 10 cases where corruption most likely took place and 22 incidents within those cases. Understanding why corruption occurs is complex. We identified two reasons mainly, to avoid oversight or enforcement. Using a port which is known to have corrupt port officials will enable a bribe to secure offloading of illegal catch or harboring illegal uh, vessels. Or bribing officials to enable vessels under arrest to abscond. Secondly, in blue, to access benefits that would increase profit or reduce cost. The most common example was bribery official to abuse their powers and issue either false fraudulent documents, such as fishing licenses or flagging doc documents. In many incidents, the two were also closely linked. Uh, we saw that uh, different people were involved. Firstly, the authorities in 12, 12 cases, we saw involved officers from non-fishing authorities, most com uh, commonly maritime authorities, flagging and port authorities, and port services. Um, we saw the role of the agent as the middleman, and he was always involved in 14 incidents in our analysis. The relationship between the owner and the agent is important, Corrupt owners seek out corrupt agents, and the agents protect or hide the owners. We need to understand the dynamic relationship and network to be able to reduce these opportunities. And I think this is an important issue when we want to reduce illegal fishing and fisheries crimes in the Indian Ocean, and it's highly relevant when we design port state measures solutions. 
If we implement PSM, we can get an efficient system established. We can use our ports as tools to refuse access to known or suspected IUU vessel, identify high-risk vessels for inspection, work across agencies to identify sanction and stop illegal operators, establish systems and procedures that reduce risk of corruption, and we can target the repeat offenders. Of course, it will also improve governance and maritime security. As a conclusion, to implement PSM, certain systems need to be in place. The advanced request for port access, or AREP, gives the authorities time to gather information and conduct a risk assessment on vessels, and not least make an informed decision to grant or deny port access or services, and whether to prioritize these vessels for inspection. Once in port, inspections are important to identify an area of violations, including illegal fishing, fortune and fraud, safety issues, and forced labor. We are not there yet, but if we identify the main obstacles, develop feasible systems and mechanisms, and not least ensure political will and support, we will move towards improved port state measures, which will contribute to the development of the regional blue growth, a development that represents a win-win situation for all the coastal states in the Indian Ocean and beyond. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Per Eric, for this broad, uh, broad presentation covering uh, the status uh, uh, of illegal fishing and also the, the importance of port state measures, um, regional cooperation, among many other things that you, you covered. I see the importance of regional cooperation, and I think that comes with a given that if all ports, if all countries cooperate with their port state measures, a very strong signal goes out against illegal fishing, but it's also nice to see the, 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 the work or the issues related to, to corruption and stopping, I know in the region, drug trafficking is a big issue which is linked with, with fisheries, uh, illegal fishing as well. So thank you very much for that. Now, what we will do now is proceed, we will proceed to a discussion of the three, three uh, presentations we have had uh, this morning. We have had the presentations by Charlene, by Florian, and Per Eric. And what I would like to do now is open up the floor for participants to bring in their suggestions, if there are issues, they have perspectives, to share those uh, with us, or if there are particular questions to the presenters, to put them to put them forward. So please, uh, if you have if you have any um, perspectives, raise your hand. Or what you could do is, of course, send a little note in the in the chat box. Um, Sesh, have you got this sorted out so that we? That's it, so that we can have uh, check the chat box and or just flag flag your raise your hand and we will give you the floor. Any any perspectives? Any. Any questions? Any issues? There's quite a bit of material which has been covered related to port state measures. So, um, and as I say, you're welcome to just send a general question in the chat box, or just raise your your flag and uh, you will have the floor. Okay, well, since we are really running out of time, let us proceed to the, the polling. Um, it seems that either everybody's been very well um, informed about this, or they... Uh, they just want so what what we will do now so what we will do is we will go to some polling of some of the of some of the issues that will be placed in the 
the guidelines. Serge, could you proceed? Okay, okay, so again, um, remember we're using Mentimeter, the Mentimeter polling. So if you go to on your, your laptop or your, your mobile, www.menti.com, and then place in a code, and the code is on the screen. The code is 49712235. You will get to this polling, and we see that there are some people who have started. And what we are asking is, do you agree with the inclusion of the port state provisions currently suggested? And we have taken four here. Um, there are others, which you will see later. So these ones, please, could you give a poll as to whether you agree with these ones? Consider ratifying the port state measures agreement for those countries in Iowa that have not. Adopt or revise national legislation fully reflecting PSMA key provisions. There is a need for strengthening capacity regarding inspection and reporting to improve the PSMA application in the Iowa region. Report port state measures related information to FAO and RFMOs as may be applicable. And this is, this is some of the work that has come out in that even though sometimes people are, are, um, have signed the PSMA um, uh, agreement, they are not reporting the, the request for information to FAO or to RFMOs. So please uh, give us a call. We have 13 participants. It's an easy process. I will uh, allow... Um, a minute for further inputs. Just to say something over because we could not put under the question adopt revised national legislation all the bullet point that we had in the roadmap. So this means basically having fishing port designated under the PSMA, designated fishing port that should be endowed with sufficient capacity, uh, inspection capacity, consider developing, adopting formal advance request scheme for entry into port, including denial of entry if there is a suspicion of IAU, and denying also port use, including landing or treatment authorization, but not only because the PSMA is not limited just to use in terms of transshipment and landing, but also any use of the port, meaning refrelling, maintenance, and sometimes country tends to limit the scope of the legislation to that, and it then limits the scope of the application of the PSMA. Okay. Nineteen. Good. Can we have one more? Anyway, one minute is over. Thank you. Next one, please, Sej. Now, okay. Okay, now those were some that were placed up. This question says, what other provisions do you suggest for the IU guidelines on port state measures? And this question is a running question. Is that right, uh, Sej? And we will keep it on for how long? We will keep it on until the end of the break. And with that, uh, we have come up to 10.23. And here I'm talking of Iowa time in the Secretariat in Mauritius. We have come to 10.24. 10, we are running a little bit late. And what I suggest is we have 10 minutes, uh, we have a 10 minute break, in which case we, those, can, those provisions 
additional provisions can be scored and others can have a little comfort break. So let us have a break. Uh, the time is 10.24 and we will come back at 10.34. Okay, thank you very much. Welcome back, and I hope you had time for a little break. We shall now con continue with um, this section, section four. So we, we have gone through all the major pillars related to the port state measures. Uh, re relating to the 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 pillars in the fight against against uh, IUU and their entry of IUU products into the seafood value chain, what we will be doing now is sharing some relevant experiences. Uh, we'll be sharing some relevant experiences relating to MCS national systems, IU guidelines, and their implementation. And we shall start off uh, with a presentation by Ms. Christine von Kostowski of the FAO. Christine is in the International Fisheries and Compliance, is an international fisheries and compliance expert with the FAO. Uh, Christine has been working in international MCS and compliance for the UN since 2018. She is working with the Fisheries Global and Regional Processes team, where she currently focuses on in-country and cross-cutting work under the Global PSMA Capacity Development Program, supporting developing countries and small island developing states to effectively implement the FAO Agreement on Port State Measures, the Port PSMA, we all know as, and also complementary international instruments and regional mechanisms to combat IUU fishing. Under the program, she has been leading an in-country capacity development program in the Caribbean, in Africa, and Southeast Asia. She's coordinating FAO's work on the FAO-IMO Joint Working Group on IUU Fishing and Related Matters, and the development of voluntary guidelines for transshipment. Christine has managed projects at the interface of science and policy for more than 20 years. She is a biologist and population geneticist by training and holds a doctorate from the University of Kiel in Germany. Christine, um, welcome uh, to this workshop and please proceed with your presentation. Many thanks for the kind introduction and good morning to all. I will now share my screen. Can you see my presentation? Yes, we can. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, and I will speak on addressing IU fishing, of course, and I've been asked to present relevant international agreements and instruments and tools to underpin the IORA guidelines. Um, and this is, in a way, like going back to chapter one after you've read a book almost um, through. So what I will do is to do that, to give a brief overview, but also highlight some aspects and instruments that I feel after having participated in this workshop need attention for the, for the development of IORA guidelines. And by that, I will also uh, support what some others have already said. And by way of a general introduction, I would like to remind us of Sustainable Development Goal 14, 
with its importance of the ocean to food security, climate regulation, whole communities, and the future of individual states. Uh, I will not uh, read out these two targets that are relevant to preventing, deterring, and eliminating IEU fishing, but highlight also that we do have the aspects here also of fishery subsidies that has been mentioned earlier, and then lead to um, the, the uh, um, fact that I, FAO is responsible for binding and non-binding instruments that can help achieve these targets. And needless to say that these targets have a timeline uh, of 2020 and that of course we are now in 2022 and much more needs to be done to achieve these targets and to ensure the long-term conservation and sustainable use of fisheries resources, maintaining their diversity and availability for present and future generations. So I will not say more about IU fishing, but jump directly into the international framework of fisheries instruments and tools that have been emerging in the recent decades and lay out the responsibilities of states, RFMOs and other relevant stakeholders to ensure the conservation and sustainable use of living marine resources, including by preventing, deterring and eliminating IU fishing. And these instruments are, of course, all based on the 1982 United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. That is our point of departure with respect to conservation of living marine resources. And legally binding instruments are, and you can see them highlighted with the uh, orange hashtag, the compliance agreements that seeks to strengthen the provisions of UNCLOS related to high seas fishing, addresses the issue of reflagging, and enhances the role of flag states in the control of their flagged vessels. We've heard about that. The United Nations Fish Stock Agreement that seeks to ensure the long-term conservation and sustainable use of straddling and highly migratory fish stocks and sets a framework for regional organizations in this regard. And the Port State Measures Agreement that we have heard much about this morning, which is a milestone in the global efforts to combat IU fishing. It is the first international legally binding instrument specifically targeting IU fishing and aims at achieving the global coverage of port state measures that will keep illegally caught fish out of national and international markets. Important also is the Code of Conduct for Responsible Fisheries that sets out principles and international standards for responsible practices to ensure the effective conservation, management and development of living aquatic resources with due respect to ecosystem and biodiversity. It is voluntary in nature, but parts of it are based on relevant rules of international law. It is probably the most, ci most cited high profile instrument after UNCLOS and within its framework, four international plans of action have been developed, including the IPOA on IEU fishing that has been repeatedly mentioned during this workshop. And there are also relevant voluntary guidelines, which are negotiated instruments that have been mentioned by previous speakers, such as the voluntary guideline on flag state performance, the voluntary guidelines for securing sustainable small-scale fisheries. We've heard about the voluntary guidelines on catch documentation schemes, uh, not so much about the voluntary guidelines on a marking of fishing gear, and hopefully in the near future, we will have guidelines for transshipment. And all these instruments lay out the responsibilities as flag, port, coastal, and market states to ensure sustainable fisheries and to combat IEU fishing. So as has been mentioned by the previous speaker, Per Eric, reality has shown that IU fishing, insufficient safety standards for crews and observers and poor working conditions are often linked. If inspections with these different objectives are coordinated and follow a risk-based approach, enforcement authorities can focus inspection capacities on high-risk vessels and have more angles to take actions against them. And given this context, and that has also been mentioned, FAO, IMO, and ILO are cooperating in a joint working group on IU fishing and related mat matters. We also have an important cooperation in this region here between IOTC and the Indian Ocean MOU in this regard, aiming 
at raising awareness and improving coordination of fisheries, maritime and labor administrations with a, po with a focus on port inspections. So therefore we do also highlight other international instruments under the IMO and ILO, especially the Cape Town Agreement and the ILO Work and Fishing Convention, uh, C188, as coordination of administration is vital so that the implementation of one agreement strengthens and doesn't undermine the implementation of another. So I think that this is worth uh, noting. And with regard to ratifications, there is still a little bit to do in the Iora region. You can see that the Cape Town Agreement and ILO Convention C188 don't have many ratifiers among the Iora member states. And it is important that the Cape Town Agreement enters into force this year. I would also like to highlight the international instrument currently under development um, because it also reflects a current challenge here in the Indian Ocean, and that is the voluntary guidelines for transshipment. The international community has for some time expressed concerns about the risks that transshipment could represent in relation to supporting IEU fishing operations and other criminal activities. And this has also been mentioned by Per Eric Berg. Uh, also with containerization on the rise, practices have emerged of fishing being directly moved into containers without proper monitoring and control and without proper documentation. And this increases the risk of IU caught fish entering the supply chain. And here we are really um, at something that is also relevant for the title of these guidelines. As Duncan Copeland has explained yesterday in his presentation, transshipment also supports unregulated fisheries, for instance, in the northwest of the Indian Ocean. And Per Eric mentioned the low levels of monitoring transshipments in ports. And so this all has to do with an increased level of risks for, of IUU caught fish entering the supply chain. In response to the general concerns, Kofi has called for two studies on transshipment. The second one, a risk-based approach showing that the lack of regulation, monitoring and control increases the risk of IUU caught fish entering the market. And Kofi last year then called upon FAO to proceed with the development of draft voluntary guidelines for transshipment and then uh, for, for them to be reviewed by an expert consultation and negotiated in a technical consultation. The expert consultation has already been held and the technical consultation is scheduled for end of May in Rome. The objective of these guidelines is to provide assistance to develop transshipment regulations or review existing ones with a view to integrating these into the broader regulatory frame framework. Back to flag, port, coastal and market state responsibilities. We have seen that combating IU fishing requires concerted action by all these states. Uh, this has become very clear in many of the previous presentations. And obviously, regional approaches are very imp important in this context to facilitate uh, information sharing and cooperation. So with this, this um, information sharing and cooperation, I also want to speak about. And to illustrate that, I'll go back to the Port State Measures Agreement. Um, and the need for systems and tools to support this information sharing and cooperation. We've just heard about the objective of the PSMA and how it blocks fisheries products derived from IU fishing from reaching the markets. Currently, there are 70 parties to the agreement from all corners of the world. And many of the uh, um, parties you cannot really see because there are small island developing states on this map. Excuse me, Kristen, you've got five minutes left. Thank you very Excellent. much. Thank you. This diagram illustrates how the agreement works. Maybe uh, looking a bit confusing at first sight, but it actually takes you from the point where a foreign flag vessel requests entry into port through to the authorization or denial of entry to the inspection and the authorization or denial of use of port. So there are three or at least three important decision points, as has also been mentioned earlier, whether to authorize or deny entry into port based on the information provided by the vessel operator, risk assessment and verification. 
and whether to inspect the vessel, and if so, what to look at or what to look for, and whether to authorize or deny use of port. And in this process, you have points of detection and verification, of action and prosecution, and of reporting and notification. And to be able to make these informed decisions, there is a need for access to timely and relevant information. There are tools and systems that provide this. And again, this, uh, these have been mentioned in previous talks. There is the global record. There are catch documentation schemes. There are other MCS tools and information gathered through previous inspections and analysis. So this is where the EPSM that Florian has been speaking about or the uh, new global information exchange system of FAO come into play. I will not go into very much detail here, but just to mention these global information sharing systems that we have that are linked to the Port State Measures Agreement and that are in various stages of development, parties of the PSMA have agreed to use these tools. We have the global record of fishing vessels, refrigerated transport vessels and supply vessels that provide certified information on vessels and vessel related activities from, from flag states. It, um, it has the primary ob objective to combat IU fishing by enhancing transparency and traceability of fishing operations and products and facilitates identification of IU uh, activities and risk assessment. Another important source of information is the PSMA app with national context points facilitating communication and access and a list of designated ports by country. And Charlene has also referred to the information not being complete yet. And we have the global information exchange system. That is another system uh, for the effective implementation of the PSMA by providing information on inspection reports and denials of port entry and um, or use. And of last year, the pilot phase for this system was launched and we can somehow refer to it as a super information system, referring to the context that Jill has mentioned for the catch documentation scheme. And it is also linked to regional systems. Uh, Florian has mentioned this, that uh, FAO and IOTC are speaking about linking the system. So this is something emerging and that could lead to a real tool providing the information at the moment when an, uh, an, uh, an MCS officer really needs to make a difficult decision. And then it is all about implementation. This has been emphasized by Charlene also very much. The PSMA will only achieve its ultimate objective if it is effectively implemented in all port states around the globe. And to be able to effectively prevent, deter and eliminate IU fishing, this applies to all states and all instruments, also the other relating to uh, flag, coastal and market state responsibilities. However, developing coastal states and small island developing states often lack the capacity to effectively implement measures while being at higher risk of being affected by IU fishing. And this is reflected in the special requirements for developing states in Article 21 of the PSMA. And against this backdrop, FAO has launched the Global PSMA Capacity Development program in order to support the implementation of the PSMA and complementary international instruments and regional mechanisms to combat IU fishing. It, of course, there, it is not the only one. There are other um, training programs and capacity development programs, and Florian has, has uh, provided a long list of what IOTC is doing in the region. So this capacity development program aims at improving states' capacity in terms of policy and legal uh, frameworks, institutional arrangements, interagency cooperation has been mentioned as an important aspect, and MCS and operational procedures. The program has supported more than 40 countries in fulfilling their international obligations as port flag coastal and market states, and the program comprises 14 projects with funding from the EU, Germany, Iceland, Norway, the Republic of Korea, Spain, Sweden, and the United States. I believe that IORA member states will also be provided a training under the program next month as requested by IORA and uh, a list of countries also in the region is um, 
has been requesting assistance under the program. And so just before I come to a close, um, some information on putting the PSMA into action and where we are at, of course, the pandemic has led to some meetings being postponed and uh, or held virtually. Um, so at the last meeting of the parties to the PSMA, the parties requested that discussions around developing a strategy to improve the effectiveness of the PSMA be deferred to an ad hoc working group which is planned to meet towards the end of this year. And in preparation of this working group, regional coordination meetings will be held, of which actually three will be relevant for the Iora region, considering that it is distributed over different world regions around the Indian Ocean. And the dates you can find in this red uh, box at the top right corner. So for more information, please consult our three uh, sections on the on IEU fishing, the PSMA, and the global record on the FAO website, or please just reach out. Many thanks. Thank you, thank you very much, Christine, for that. And and uh, uh, I was particularly interested in the guide ads being produced um, on transshipment, but you have also covered the many products that FAO provides and many much support that it provides across the region and of course in keeping with this workshop some super some super global information systems that are under development, under development. thank you very much for that and I shall now I shall now um, uh, ask uh, I shall now the, the person who will now be um, presenting is Mr. Shukot Kabir Chaudhuri, the Dis Assistant Director of the Department of Fisheries, the Ministry of Fisheries and Livestock of Bangladesh. Mr. Chaudhuri joined the department through the Bangladesh Public Service in 2006. As a fisheries officer, he's been working in the marine wing of the Department of Fisheries, contributing to the development of the marine fisheries conservation and management related issues in that region, that area. He is working as the focal point for um, Bangladesh, the focal point of IOTC for Bangladesh. He's also the alternate focal point of the cluster group of fisheries management of Iora, which of course we have heard um, about yesterday. Um, they're one of the, the core groups um, that uh, Iora has dealing with fisheries management. He's an alternate national contact for the PSMA, and he has uh, been working with you and ODC, the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime Matters. He's worked as the national focal point of Bangladesh for FAO's regional technical cooperation project in support to countries to address IUU fishing in 2019. Um, he will be presenting the Bangladesh National Plan of Action Combating IU fishing and current implementation, current MCS implementation. Perspectives on that. Mr. Chowder Chowdhury, welcome and please proceed with your presentation. Uh, thank you, Abroy. Uh, thank you very much for your introduction. Uh, and uh, I'm going to uh, sharing my screen. Uh, is it okay? It needs to be placed in uh, presentation mode. It's just in slide mode. Do the slideshow. You do all the rights. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Not yet. But uh, here it is showing that it is in slide mode. It, it needs to be in presentation mode. Up, up on the top as well, you've got a slideshow. If you click that, you'll you'll get a slideshow. 
in the menu bar on top of uh, yes uh, i'm doing that but uh, in my screen uh, it is show on uh, slide show mode but uh, uh, right on top you have uh, maybe it's a little delay in the connection but we can have it we can have it like that it's okay if if you really have a problem we can have it like okay, that okay okay uh, I, i think i can uh, continue because uh, of your time constraint uh, so uh, first of all i would like to thanks for giving me the opportunity to share of uh, bangladesh national plan of action iu fishing and kind mcs implementation uh, system and uh, uh, dear uh, uh, participants uh, uh, the outline of my presentations uh, is uh, background of bangladesh fisheries uh, legal framework national plan of uh, action iu fishing kind mcs implementation and recommendations for developing a regional guidelines and uh, this is the uh, global uh, position of uh, bangladesh and the bangladesh is a south asian country located beside the bay of bengal and we have uh, 147000 square kilometer land area and 118 uh, uh, 100000 Uh, square kilometer of sea area and our total population is uh, 160 million and uh, the almost half of bangladesh yes, uh, yes. Na national area is uh, ocean uh, and uh, excuse me uh, mr chaudhary could you just push your down button so that we we move because we're stuck on the same slide the arrow the down arrow the down arrow on the bottom right corner of your of your keyboard can you try that just the arrow that points downwards it is not working no we're no. still on the on the first slide okay okay then i can uh, stop my sharing and again start okay okay you, you know what we could do for you we yeah. can open the presentation for you like we did for other participants do we have it just run the show of course do we, we have, have it, it. Yes. let me try again for for see if this it seems to be working okay so. it is okay now No, no. Look oh, at the top, the very top. You've got at the very top. You've got yes. a list of things. It says slideshow. You see at the very top of your screen. Yes. No, 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 no. You have. Uh, I am sharing and window. Yes. Click. Screen. We're going to run it from here. If it's fine for you, we will just, you know, go. Okay, that's it. So, so Okay. It. No, no. We are doing it. Okay. Okay, it's okay now. It's okay now? Yes. But Okay. But okay, thank you. Uh, uh, we've seen this one. Please. Thank you. But it is it's not moving here. You need to move the down arrow. Yeah, Or yes, I am. but it is not moving next next that's it okay that's it there we go it's moving now yes yes wonderful okay yes so th uh, this is the uh, outline of my presentation and that is the background of bangladesh fisheries legal framework uh, national plan of action are you fishing current mcs implementation and developing a regional uh, guidelines uh, its a recommendation and this is the position of uh, bangladesh in the global map and that is we are located in the south asian country we said bev bengal uh, we have 147000 square kilometer land area and 1800000 square kilometer sea area and a total population of our country is 160 million and it is almost half of our national area is oceanic this is the position of uh, 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 fisheries uh, under the statement of world fisheries and aquaculture uh, in the inland capture fisheries our we are ranked in uh, third according to the 2020 report and in case of fish production it is the fifth position Uh, according to the report and a national contribution of fisheries sector in bangladesh is the main the core area is for employment uh, for food supply and for export earning 
the marine fisheries sector, a, a, a quick view of marine fisheries sector of Bangladesh. We have 250 plus industrial vessels, which are operating uh, only uh, the 10, 100 meter depth from the baseline towards sea. And we have a large uh, number of mechanized boats that is uh, uh, 4,000 plus mechanized boat, which are operating in the up to the 40 meter depth from baseline towards sea. And the deeper zone of the EZ of Bangladesh is, is still uh, unutilized. Uh, as well as we have the uh, monitoring system for fisheries resources, uh, for the uh, fishery independent uh, survey. We have uh, our own research vessel and uh, uh, according to, uh, and in accordance with uh, FO and IMR, we have uh, some uh, survey with uh, Dr. Fitzgerald of Nansen. Uh, with the uh, uh, support of World Bank, we have a large project for development and extending our MCCM, uh, MCS system. And it is the sustainable coastal and marine fisheries project. And uh, our government is very keen to explore the blue economy from our EZ and we would like to uh, introduce uh, long liner and personal and uh, for this reason government are already sanctioned uh, 10 long liner and personal but still there is no vessel for high sea in Bangladesh and uh, for the lack of historical data we have taken a government project tuna and tuna like other pelagic uh, project for the survey of uh, uh, our EZ for the uh, tuna like fisheries and uh, the marine sector of Bangladesh is, is still a potential area for joint venture of sea fishing, tuna product development and export earnings. And it is the, our uh, export and quality control uh, section. Uh, and uh, the, we have three international standard accredited uh, fish inspection and quality control labs. We have uh, HACCP uh, along the value chain traceability system in place. And in uh, 2019 and 20, our annual fishery export is uh, 70,000 plus metric ton. And the main fishery product is frozen shrimp and prawn, live fish, frozen fish, uh, chilled fish, dry fish, salted, dehydrated fish, crab and eels and others. And major uh, exporting uh, uh, countries, EU, USA, Canada, Russia, Middle East and China. And one of the biggest uh, uh, achievement of our quality control lab is that since 2015, there is no need to, uh, for further uh, sampling test in EU after the arrival of our uh, uh, container in EU. Uh, national and international instruments for the combating uh, IU fishing uh, uh, in, in, uh, my, in our previous presenter, she very uh, deeply explained these instruments, but I am aligning with our uh, national instruments with these uh, international instruments that uh, uh, UNCLOS 1992, Bangladesh certified, CCRF uh, Bangladesh certified, uh, IPOIU fishing 2021, and uh, protested measures segment 2009, Bangladesh certified in 2019. Aligned with these international instruments, Bangladesh developed a uh, hard uh, maritime. Yeah. The Donation Act 1974, and in 19. 83, we developed our Marine Fisheries Ordinance and Marine Mercantile uh, market uh, Shipping Ordinance 1983. And in 2020, we developed our Marine Fisheries Ordinance to Marine Fisheries Act. And in the 2021, uh, we developed our National Plan of Action IU Fishing, as well as we developed our uh, Industrial Fisheries Management Plan in 2021. Uh, under the national uh, uh, legislative system uh, in Marine Fisheries Act 2020, uh, the main provisions in this act is the prevent, deter, and eliminate of IU fishing, that is Section uh, 501, development of MCS, vessel licensing, sailing permission, arrival report, pre and post inspection, uh, catch report, logbook, and IU catch certifications. It will be you know, on uh, rules and uh, the Fish and Fish Products Inspection and Quality Control Act 20, uh, 2020, it covers the export and import of uh, fishery items and the traceability system for supply chain. And 
the Bangladesh Merchant Shipping Ordinance covered the vessel registrations and certificate of fitness of fishing vessels and all other commercial vessels. So the background of uh, developing the IU fish uh, national plan of action IU fishing uh, in line with the IPOIOA uh, in 2016 uh, under the meeting of Asia 33rd Asia Pacific uh, Regional Conference, Bangladesh and other four countries uh, requested FAO to develop uh, a, a TCP for developing the national plan of action and uh, according to, uh, with this, uh, FAO developed the regional TCP program for developing the national plan of action uh, of uh, the said five countries, uh, along with developing the cooperation. And uh, under this TCP project, Bangladesh, Cambodia, Myanmar, and Thailand, and Vietnam will cover with this project. And under this project, we have uh, um, conducted three consultation meeting in Dhaka, uh, our coastal district, uh, Chattogram and Bolichal, and uh, after uh, following a validation workshop, we uh, finalized our national plan of action. And this is the main feature of our national plan of action, which covered the interaction, all state uh, responsibilities, flag state responsibilities, coastal state responsibilities, port state, market related measures, regional uh, fisheries management organization, and a special requirements of developing countries. Excuse me, Mr. So, Charawi, you have five minutes left. Okay, thank uh, okay, thank you. Uh, the uh, the covering uh, the main uh, actions uh, under this national plan of action, it is covered uh, 45 uh, actions and the timeline for uh, 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 implementing the the national plan of action is 2020 to 2024. Under this national plan of action, uh, we identified state responsibilities, 30 action, flag state responsibilities, five action. Uh, coastal state responsibilities, it is the combination of state and flag state responsibilities, port state measures, four, and market related measures, six. So I'm going uh, into the Protested measures here we identified uh, ratified PSMA. We already ratified advance uh, notice of arrival, uh, building capacity to audit APERS, designated ports, uh, clearly designating ports for foreign fishing vessels, building inspection capacity, and implementing IOTC regulations for protested measures. And in case of market related activities, uh, we identified the actions are prohibit import of IU fishing publicized businesses involved in IU, voluntary guidelines for catch documentation, electronic reporting, and traceability through the supply chain. And in case, and under this uh, National Plan of Action, uh, our main, uh, the, we identified six uh, actions under this uh, market related activities that is prohibit import of IU fishing implemented, FO guidelines, establishing reporting, uh, institute cash certification system, implement measures to improve transparency and traceability, and disseminate and publish business involved uh, in or supporting IU fishing. And in our current MCM system, that is monitoring, control, and surveillance under monitoring, we have a separate monitoring wing, wing that is Marine Fisheries, uh, Marine Fisheries Survey Management Unit. Uh, it is established in 1995. Uh, for control, uh, we have main fisheries office, uh, which uh, uh, had been uh, established in 1952. And in case of surveillance, we, um, uh, in association with Bangladesh Navy, Bangladesh Coast Guard, River Police, and our inspect inspector, we have uh, done this work. And this is a short scenario of our current MCN system. And uh, finally, I am going to the uh, the recommendation part. Uh, 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 from our side, uh, uh, we want to say that uh, align with RFMO, that means in case of I, uh, for our RFMO IOTC, uh, IU related uh, regulations, we have to consider uh, the IOTC regulations for developing the IOLA guidelines. And in this region, there are we have Epific, Asia Pacific Fisheries Commission, Safe Jack, InfoFish, NACA, Bay of Bengal program. So they have uh, all have some. Um, uh, guidelines or regulations, so we have to incorporate all these uh, 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 bodies uh, for developing a IRA regulation. 
And our second proposal is networking with member states, uh, fisheries monitoring center. We have to, we have to uh, um, uh, uh, de develop a protocol for networking among all MS uh, fisheries monitoring center for combating IU fishing. We can identify a national focal point for IU fishing um, in Iora region uh, for quick response of member countries for any combating of uh, IU fishing in the high sea or uh, in the bo uh, maritime border of our uh, neighboring countries. Uh, establishing database and sharing protocol, uh, it, it is a common issue. And IU catch certification for the export and import of fishery products administrativity uh, already you uh, developed, uh, and now uh, Japan and Thailand also uh, developed their uh, IU catch certification scheme. And uh, another issue is joint surveillance in maritime boundary for unregulated fishing. We can uh, develop a joint surveillance protocol uh, in in maritime area uh, boundary area and uh, uh, sub regional initiatives uh, are already a good initiatives taken by the uh, Indonesia developing the regional plan of action uh, the uh, Southeast Asian and Australian part they are involving with this regional plan of action and. Uh, ASEAN also develop a cash documentation scheme. So some sub regional schemes may be developed under these uh, guidelines. And uh, finally, uh, the capacity building of member states, it is a very common and needed area for developing our uh, PSMA and market related uh, uh, activities uh, regarding IO fishing. Capacity building development, uh, I think is the most. And another issue is the development of infrastructure and financial support for uh, implementation uh, of these uh, guidelines and uh, other binding instruments. Uh, so thank you very much uh, for your uh, time and the patient sharing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chaudhary. And uh, thank you for that. Uh, actually, um, it's it's a very welcome sign to see that your country, um, Bangladesh, one of the IOR member states, now has an NPOA um, combating IUU, um, which you developed and you put it to, put into effect uh, in two thousand and and. Um, 21. So, and also, I can see you have several recommendations. One of which is that uh, in in this process, we should make sure that we're aware of some of the other initiatives and other guidelines, and seek to consider them or incorporate them. So, thank you, thank you very much for that, and thank you for sharing your thank your you. actual situation. Um, next, we will have um, a presentation from. From Mrs. Sandali Herath. She is the Deputy Director of the Department of Fisheries and Aquatic Resources of Sri Lanka. Mrs. Herath is engaged in the management of fisheries in her Department of Fisheries and Aquatic Resources, Sri Lanka, since 2008. Her work involves itself in the management of the sharks fishery and the beach seine fishery, also the preparation of the NPAO, AIUU for sharks. And so the National Plan of Action IUU for Sri Lanka, as well as the National Plan of Action for sharks. She is also involved in the regulation of fish exports, conducts fishers training and awareness development programs for fishers, the preparation of fisheries management plans and other such management activities. She has participated in a number of regional and international fisheries conferences as a member of the Sri Lanka fisheries management team. Mrs. Sandala, Sandra Mali Heras, welcome, and please present your 
presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning, good afternoon to you all, depending on where are you. And also, thank you for my introduction. Uh, and uh, can you please, because there is a power failure at my office, so can you please share my presentation? Because uh, uh, I am using my uh, mobile phone to uh, do this presentation. Yes. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Would yeah. you like us to... Oh, you're doing it. Actually, uh, Mrs... Actually, um, it is already being done, Mrs. Herat. So we, yeah, your yeah, presentation yeah. is on the screen. Please proceed. Okay. Yes. Thanks. Yeah, I, I'm. Uh, I'll be talking about Sri Lanka National Plan of Action to Prevent, Deter, and Eliminate IUU fishing. Actually, this document has been prepared in line with uh, FAO International Plan of Action. And this includes all the measures that Sri Lanka as a port state, coastal state, market state, and a black state, how we are going to combat IUU fishing. So um, this uh, includes all the things. So next slide, please. Uh, now we'll look at why Sri Lanka should compact IUU fishing. IUU fishing continues to threaten Sri Lanka as fishing interest. Actually, it caused damage to fish habitat through destructive fishing practices, a rapid and severe depletion of fish stock, and reduced value and condition of fish due to poor handling, and also threat to fisheries officers. And moreover, actually, apart from all the things, our fish will not be imported to uh, EU countries if we do IUU fishing. That is also main uh, problem and also we were issued red card earlier to Sri Lanka, so now it's okay and we now continue to do uh, all the things to come back to IUU fishing. So next, um, uh, yeah. So we'll see what are the objectives and principles of this NPO. Actually, this has been uh, prepared, as I told earlier, in line with IPOA. So, so this is uh, in, in according to IPO, this has been prepared. So Sri Lanka commits to um, commits to implement measures against IOU fishing directly through the fisheries management mechanism that has been established by the government or in cooperation with other coastal states or indirectly through IOTC or other RFMO as appropriate by providing the necessary support, including information. So we have very good link with other countries and other organizations to come back this IOU fishing. So the other one, uh, actually, SN, um, this document uh, to be reviewed biennially and revised by incorporating adjustment or changes required to address issues encountered in its Im implementation. So there are minimum delays in responding emerging issues. Uh, new and improved measures continue to be developed. So this will be uh, revised as. Um, biennially and also we will incorporate all the measures and changes uh, to this one. We actually this document firstly we prepared in 2013 and later it was revised in 2015. Now recently again we revised uh, and uh, adapted in uh, 2020. So SLNPO is consists with and seeks to enhance long-term sustainable utilization of fish stock and also protection of the marine environment. So uh, this covers all marine, uh, next please. Uh, this covers all marine captive fisheries within Sri Lankan waters and outside and includes an integrated approach involving coastal state measures, flag state measures, port state measures and market state measures where applicable. Uh, so all local stakeholders that include fish boat owners, fishing boat owners, operators, skippers, masters and fishers, fish traders and exporters, fisheries managers, and uh, fishery law enforcement officials, fishery researchers, and all NGOs are aware of this document, that we have published this document um, uh, on our website as well. So next slide also, the repeat in the same thing. So next one, please. Yeah. 
uh, yeah so as a responsible nation sri lanka has ratified several most of the fishery related convention so uh, we are part to um, unclose uh, yeah, indian ocean tuna commission actually we are a founder member of iotc and also fao compliance agreement code of conduct and international plan of action sector i am I'm happy to say that that we have developed uh, in addition to this slnpo uh, npoa iuu we have developed npoa sharks to conserve and manage uh, shark fishery so also we have ratified un fish stock agreement fao port states agreement and also as i mentioned earlier we are member of iotc and other than this agreement we that sri lanka has ratified cms and cites uh, agreement also but their uh, focal point is not in our department of fisheries that the focal point is sri lanka wildlife department so uh, next please uh, so main contents of slnpo when we look at the, uh, the slnpo contents it includes flag state responsibilities as a flag state and monitoring control and surveillance activities coastal state measures port state measures market state measures and other action that means um, what are the other action that we are going to implement in future to combat this iuu fishing yeah so we will see that uh, flag state measures uh, next one please next uh, yeah. um, so as a flag state we have very good legislation so uh, our fisheries uh, our main legislation for fishery related thing is the fisheries and aquatic resources act number 2 of 1996 that has been amended several times but main amendment was done after 2013 because uh, eu um, uh, issued us a uh, yellow card Uh, because of that we actually have uh, main uh, our amendments are in 2013 15 16 and 17 out of which that, that in 2013 one is the main uh, our amendment because uh, we have incorporated all the international conservation and management measures to our legislation from this amendment so 2013 one 2015 and 16 actually we amended to increase penalties for our act so that, those are the amendments to um, actually as i mentioned we amended to for giving effect to international convention on fisheries management and also to regulate local fishing boards in high seas by registering the men issuing high seas fishing operation license and also prohibiting local fishing board from unauthorized fishing in waters of other coastal states and provide in literal penalties for infringement that's why we amended in 2015 and 16 of our act yeah so um, uh, next slide please uh, so regulation also made requiring local fishing boards over 10.3 meters fishing in high seas so uh, these regulations um, actually gazetted uh, to register dfar that fishing boats should register um, with our dfar also they should obtain high seas fishing license um, those uh, vessels who are going to high seas and also mark in accordance with the, um, if uh, vessel should mark in accordance with the fao specification together with gear carried on boards and also to provide data on fish catches and area of fishing to install uh, vms devices on board that means transponder to monitor the movements of the boat uh, also to abstain from catching protected species sri lanka has protected uh, several species marine species like um, marine mammals sea turtle and also um, some uh, shark species threaten shark species like oceanic white trip shesha shark and also whale shark so uh, we uh, we have done those conservation measures as well so next 
side this uh, yeah so so we'll uh, see what are the monitoring control and surveillance activities uh, excuse me mrs uh, hevath we've got five minutes more thank you very much uh, yeah okay thank you yeah so satellite based uh, transponder fix on board linked to land based fisheries monitoring center that is also that vms we have implemented vms and also ssp radio so the radio communication network to facilitate communication between fishing boats and district fisheries office also in place in sri lanka and also boat crews are encouraged to provide information on iuu fishing um, actually that is mostly uh, on the high seas fishing so uh, can you move the slide please yeah so mechanized boat all mechanized boats are required to maintain log books for recording catch and areas of fishing that is also mandatory and on board observer to be deployed for fishing boats over 24 meters also mandatory but actually uh, we will send most of the um, boats uh, not uh, according to iotc it should be 5% but we are covering most uh, boats uh, more than uh, 24 meters. and also inspection of fishing vessels by authorized officers uh, before departure of the vessels and also after the arrival of the vessels is done uh, at all fishery harbors so uh, next slide please uh, so when we talk about coastal state measures uh, we don't issue permit to third country vessels to fish in sri lankan seas the because we have enough vessels so we are not going to give our is to other countries to fish in sri lankan waters and also there are penalty also we increase we have uh, good act to uh, manage these third country vessels uh, even though we don't issue permits if they catch in sri lankan waters we um, take legal actions against those vessels so uh, when we move to port state measures next slide yeah so third country next slide please next one Uh, so um, third country vessels are not allowed to land fish in any port of sri lanka without the fish landing permit obtained from dfar that means department of fisheries so application for fish landing permit should be submitted in prescribed form actually uh, 48 hours uh, before and if it is a second time landing or subsequent in 24 hours before uh, proposed landing so sri lanka has de designated and published the uh, designated ports uh, in iotc and also uh, department website and any changes updated accordingly so next slide please uh, actually no fish land in permit are issued to uh, third country vessels which have engaged in iuu fishing so we um, actually look into details of their vessel uh, and everything and if it is if we found something iuu done for iuu fishing then iuu fishing then definitely we are not issuing uh, port um, uh, to land uh, third country vessels uh, if they are, have done iuu fishing so that is uh, our uh, mandate and also third country vessels are uh, inspected by team of fisheries uh, inspectors and inspection reports are submitted to iotc and, uh, and to the flag state uh, of that vessel so when we uh, talk about the market state measures um, yeah owners operators of local fishing boats that supply fish for export are required to submit a catch certificate in respect of each landing that is also mandatory and exporters are required to obtain validated catch certificate from uh, the dg dfar like our director general of department in respect of each export consigned month importers uh, importers importing fish for uh, re exports are re required to submit catch certificate and process uh, statements obtained from the competent authority of the country of fish uh, import 
So important export goods must be in compliance with uh, CITES. That was CITES certificates are issued uh, from the Department of Wildlife. So um, our Sri Lankan all import, export and re-export uh, products are issued uh, to CITES if it is listed in CITES uh, schedules. So we'll see what uh, what are the key management uh, tools used by the FAR. So boat used for high seas fishing should be registered as, as high seas fishing board. That is excuse one me, thing and also... Excuse me, Madam Herat. Um, we've yeah. got about a minute left. Uh, yeah, okay, thank okay, you, thank, thank you. you. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, so uh, your fishing operation uh, for the high seas fishing operation license should be obtained from the department, all vessels who are going to high seas fishing, and also um, uh, the no fishing should be done in waters of other coastal uh, states without authorization. And uh, fishing boats should be fitted with VMS device and information on the geographical position, cruise uh, direction, speed the exit should be provided. Information on fishing areas and catches should be recorded in logbooks carried out on board and submitted to authorized officers. So, um, other um, slide please. Uh, marking of um, boat numbers and call sign on boat hull made compulsory and marking of fishing gears also compulsory and use of gill nets over 2.5 kilometers and also catching of mammals, turtles, treasure shark, whale shark and oceanic white tips are prohibited. Uh, taking on board um, line cutters and dry hookers made compulsory. Uh, so um, next slide, please. Sorry for <laughs> not in the, uh, line with the time schedule. So uh, fishing boat inspected prior to departure and upon arrival in regard to boat registration, fishing operation, and also gear carried out on board, prohibited the species land and amount of catch and logbook records, etc. We are looking at the, uh, at all the harbors. So, so observers uh, deployed on board at the boats of uh, 24 meters and over. So um, Sri Lanka is planning to do some following activities next slide uh, in order to be fully comply with international conservation and management measures. So we are going to strengthen our legal framework further and also expansion of vessel monitoring system. That means we are going to fit uh, um, expand that to all multi-day vessels and also adopt government policy not to grant in fiscal in incentives or benefits to comply um, companies, owners, operators of local fishing boat engaged in IUU fishing. So also next slide, standardized certification and documentation requirements and set up electronic scheme where possible in order to facilitate uh, transaction and avoid opportunities for fraud. Conduct programs for development and awareness programs. So for, for all the stakeholders, we are conducting uh, awareness program. Next slide, please. Uh, use of software solution to assure efficient operational and administrative process also in place and also strengthening of, uh, strengthening of data collection system uh, we actually in, in process and also inserting clear definition to international use terminology including IUU fishing and beneficial owners to FAR, the FAR means our fishery sack. So um, inclusion of geog geographical scope to which the provisions of FARA shall be imposed. Also, we are going to uh, include that one to our FARA by amending that one in future. So, um, other one actually, that uh, next one, inserting provisions to clear distinctions of role of different officers having responsibilities in the enforcement of FARA and publish and enforce the regulation on departure, launch, and arrival of fishing board. That is, we are going to get a new regulation on that topic and also strengthen the provisions of FARA related to the vessel importation, registration, cancellation of, of registration, export after the registration that has been actually drafted and now very recently we are going to get that regulation. Next one, last one. 
yeah so a revision of all existing regulation in line with the fara new amendment one it is adopted so we are going to uh, uh, our amend our act uh, very recently and accordingly we are going to amend our all the regulations and categorization of uh, serious and non serious infringement in legislation and impose penalties according to that is also one thing that we are going to do in future inclusion of uh, inclusion of clear legal basis for uh, basis for fish catch data recording the use of logbook in the uh, fara so because we are go we have already introduced electronic logbook so we are going to amend according to accordingly uh, our regulation so thank you so much for your attention thank you thank you very much mrs herath and thank you for this for this very broad uh, uh, examination of your npoa and and uh, the actions that you're doing and uh, also for for filling us up on on the the suite of future actions that that is being planned in in response to to uh, combating illegal unreported and unregulated fishing thank you very much for your presentation uh, and now the next presentation um will be coming from from the Seychelles let's see our next presentation is on FAO voluntary okay good so so our next presentation is from mr rodi alisson uh rodi is the assistant manager at the mcs section of the seychelles fishing authority um his his um his presentation actually uh, i think is is uh, it may not be on this i think it may be on fao voluntary guidelines for flag state performance in seychelles lessons learned that's that should be quite interesting now uh rodi graduated with distinction from the university of wollongong he holds a masters degree in fisheries policies and his field of speciality is in fisheries management and mcs in his 16 years of working for the seychelles fishing authority mr alisop has a master of an incredible amount of knowledge and professional experience while occupying different post levels within the seychelles monitoring control and surveillance division currently mr alisop is occupying the post of head of the fisheries monitoring center and he has worked on different mcs projects such as on the electronic logbook project on the small vessel tracking unit project under the seychelles vms program as an elect on the electronics observer program on national drones for fisheries surveillance program on the national and regional fisheries surveillance program uh, and the mcs monitoring platform sfa themis fusion center welcome rodi and please proceed with your presentation um thank you abri for the introduction uh hello everyone hi uh, Okay. Is it possible to share the screen on your side? Yeah, I'm I'm not, yeah, I'm trying to share now right now. Okay. Can you see? Yes, we can see. It. You just need to do it as a slide show now. Yeah. Ah. Uh. 
during pre-presentation. I should have sent the trying to present you. You're on a pre-presentation mode. Yeah, I yeah, will try to reshare it. Yeah. It's on your display settings. On your display settings at the top. On the top. There we go. There we go. Fantastic. Thanks. Is it there now? Yep. Yes. Perfect. Fine. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Um, my presentation will be based on the uh, voluntary guideline for flagship performance. Um, uh, Seychelles was assessed back in 2019 on the uh, performance for flagship. And uh, when we finished the, uh, the assessment, um, there were about uh, eight findings and uh, 44 actions that the Seychelles had to action on. <laughs> And whoever is sleeping in the background, please call. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, uh, since there, there were about 44 action plan to um, implement, uh, I had to cut down some of the uh, some of my pres presentation to uh, to display um, the most relevant one that we have action on. Um, this is my pre presentation overview. Um, uh, general, general information. Um, I will discuss about the uh, overview of uh, Shishal's, uh location and then administration is about the fisheries administration and then the uh, registration administration of lagging of vessels and then i will discuss a bit about the fisheries sector and then uh, we'll talk about the mcs tools as a flag set that we are using to monitor our fishing vessel at sea and then the flag set control is about the action plan okay um uh, thresholds is considered to be a a strategic location in the Indian Ocean for the personas because they use the Victoria fishing as a main hub. And uh, tuna fishery is a major economic driver for, for the fishery sector. Shishas has a population of 99,000 people. So we depend a lot on the fishery because we have a lot of ocean and uh, limited mass area. Um, SFA was established in uh, 1984, and it is a autonomous autonomous satellite organization which falls under the Ministry of Fisheries and Agri and Fisheries and Blue Economy. And we are governed by a board of directors. And SFA is the executive arm of the ministry, so we are mandated to oversee the fisheries, to oversee and manage the fisheries, both beyond and territorial sea. We have uh, inter-agency coordination with the SMSA because SMSA is the authority that uh, keeps the ledger on the marine time registry for our flag vessel. So before we uh, flag a vessel, the uh, SFA have to vet the vessel if it's okay to be flagged or not. And then we send the re recommendation to the SMSA. Um, however, um, uh, on the SMSA list of vessels, you will see that they, they, they flagged, they register only vessels above 24 meters in length. So on our list, there will be only the uh, long line vessels above 24 meters and the personals. Um, because of the current act, they are not covering any vessel below 24 meters. But we SFA, we do keep records of all our fishing vessels. Um, the artisanal fishery. The artisanal fishery, the boats are made of inland, especially in 
from one to five meters, from 1.5 meters minimum to 16 meters um, maximum in length. They uh, fish mainly for demersal and small pelagic, and they target octopus, sea cucumber, and lobster and other species that we uh, authorize them to uh, to harvest under the Fishes Act. They are limited to uh, operate only in the Seychelles exclusive economic zones, and the fishery is reserved only for Seychelles. The semi-industrial industry, um, our boat is made from uh, inland from 12 to 20 meters. And we have around 52 vessels currently registered. And they target mainly uh, swordfish and tuna-like species. The total catch per year is around 250 to 300 tons. And they keep the, their catch on ice or on ice, yeah. Our industrial fleet is made up of longliners and personas, and they range from, uh, there's a mistake there. They, made, they range from uh, 24 meters up to uh, to 30, 30 and above. And they target, uh, the targeting species are tuna and tuna like species. And between, in, 2000, in 2022, um, uh, we had registered 13 personas, four supply vessels, and 62 long liners. The MCS tools that we are currently using as a flag state, we use it to promote compliance during a vessel, a vessel fishing operation so that we uh, use it to, so it, uh, it can act as a deterrent for the fishing vessels when they are engaged in fishing activities. Um, uh, our traditional way we previously used, and then we are still using um, in conjunction with the, with the new system, we are using paper logbooks, catch and effort reports, the vessels send us the information via emails when they add you on their catch reports. And then we use VMS to track the location. We have scientific observers on personals only. And then uh, we conduct uh, sea patrols um, within the uh, EZ and uh, with the uh, regional and under the regional surveillance program as well. Uh, our current modern tools we are using to monitor vessels, we have upgraded our system, our VMS system, to to be able to monitor all our flags, vessel or registered vessels. Um, we are monitoring fishing vessels starting from the uh, artisanal fishery. We're currently installing small transceivers on board the, those vessels, so we can know their fishing area, so we can use those data, those data in uh, down the line for fisheries management purposes so we know which area those vessels are actually fishing and uh, we can monitor their catch when they are landing those catch we can compare those data afterwards if we need to close certain area for those type of fishery we have the electronic logbook which we are currently we are currently using on our personas and uh, future down the line, they will be they will be installed on the online vessels and then the simulation vessels. We're using the electronic logbook because in the past we had some issues with the paper logbook. Um, the uh, captain of the of those vessels were not actually um, uh, filling those logbook quite correctly, or they were not declaring if they were having any interaction with other species like turtles or mammals. So that's why we also introduced the uh, dry observer program, the fishes observer program. Um, SFA already have a scientific observer program that they put 
on personals, but the drive dry observer program is a fisheries observer program that we give our observers power to uh, to be a, a compliance observer plus a scientific observer. So they are monitoring all the activities at sea when the personals are currently harvesting the, their catch. So since we have put the, the system on board, um, uh, we've detected some slight infractions, but I think the system has assisted us a lot with the, with the vessels reporting because the, the captains knows that the system is on board and when the, the vessel comes to port, we remove the camera, we remove the hard disk of the camera. Um, uh, so we monitor those activities and uh, we usually process one trip within one week. Uh, so um, uh, as soon as we finish with the personals, we will, mo we will be moving with the, the longliners. But issues with longliners right now, um, those vessels are currently calling to port two times, at least two times per year. And uh, we, with the COVID situation, we've been having a slow deployment with the, with the longliners, with both the ERS and the EMS programs. But we do have a full hundred percent coverage on the on the personals. Okay, my next slide is about the flag state control. Um, uh, the uh, the result and finding in the box is a bit small. I don't know if you can read it, but uh, under the fisheries management program, um, uh, there were. We were advised that there were findings on uh, reporting of bycatch interaction of various species under the conservation and protection measures. So um, uh, the action plan um, uh, we were given was to formalize the enforcement action necessary to obtain the compliance from operators with their logbook reporting duties. So we, when we had installed the uh, the ERS and EMS, um, like I said previously, we got some good data and uh, the, the fishers were more, they were more obliged to, uh, to fill those information. So uh, for the personers, we were able to get a 100% coverage on them. But for, like I said, the long miners, um, uh, we had some issues due to COVID and uh, the port calling of those vessels. And the, the next box is about the uh, monetary research, which uh, under the IOTC resolution for 2005, which wasn't, which, which, uh, which, sorry, the research was not being undertaken by the research section. So uh, we had an action plan to ensure that we uh, we put more effort in our research division to to keep an eye on uh, on the monitoring of 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 those uh, research of turtles and and fads. Excuse me, Roddy. We've got five minutes more. Thank you. Okay, I'll, I'll be very quick. Um, uh, we had the seabird bycatch mitigation measures which were identified as uh, lacking. And we were advised to, uh, to, uh, to develop the, um, uh, to develop our system and uh, improve on our reporting system for the resolution 1206. And this is currently under review. And for FADS, for logbook, there was a, an issue with our FAD logbook system because uh, all of it was in paper base and uh, due to remote, due to human resources, um, uh, constraint we were having issues to uh, to digitize those data. So with external logbook as well, so we will be we will be able to sort out those issues. And then we had the issues on uh, FAD management plan as well. Action plan was to uh, ensure that FAD 
the file plan is revised and developed according to the new templates. So this the fisheries management division has already completed this one. Um, uh, there was issues about these license fees for these semi-industrial tuna long lines, which were which were seen as uh, inadequate and because it was so low. Um, uh, this is one is currently in working progress because uh, um, uh, we need to dis the ministry is currently discussing with the stakeholders and uh, they will be they will be raising the price in the in down the line. And then the, uh, it's almost the last one. There were issues about the longliners that we had, we did not have any observers on board. Um, uh, this issue was because of the working condition about the, the longliners, so it was impossible for for SFA to be able to get someone to put on the longliners. And uh, since the longliners spent more than six months at sea, it was very inconvenient for for the observers. So that's why we decided to put the the EMS system on board log liners. So we will cover the the percentage that we are lacking for to monitor observers on long lines. And then there, there were other action plans given for the observer program for scientific observers. Um, it was found that the uh, management implement plan for the observers were, there, there were quite a, a few weaknesses, so the fish management was advised to to um, to amend um, uh, the deployment management plan. Record of authorized vessels. Um, uh, this one, it's about the um, authorization to fish records. In 2019, this information was kept with the uh, fishing management, but the vetting of vessels were being done by the MCS and uh, the documentation and the, and the data was kept by the MCS. So it was advised that all the information should be moved to the MCS and uh, the fishing management should be there only to give the final say if the uh, the vessel should be should be should receive an authorization to fish outside these issues, is that or not? And then there was discussion about the beneficial ownership of a vessel. This one is still in uh, work in progress as well, because we are currently still amending our Fishes Act, which is still in a work in progress. And then the monitoring control and surveillance. Um, it was seen that as the uh, it was seen that officers, like especially the enforcement officers, were not completely wearing the uniforms. So, it was advised to SFA to to ensure that when the enforcements are going on site for inspection, they should be wearing a uniform that identifies them, especially as an uh, authorized fisheries officer. So this is completed. And uh, all our enforcement officers currently were wearing the appropriate uh, uniforms. There were other findings as well due to po police training um, for inspection. This one, um, uh, our enforcement officer is currently being trained under the police academy. And then uh, they currently have been sent for training uh, with the University of uh, Mandela in South Africa as well for enforcement training. You got a minute left. All right. And then uh, there was discussion about the semi-industrial domestic fleet. Um, uh, some of the uh, semi-industrial fishing fleet before 2019, they did not have uh, the VMS on board. So it was decided to ensure that we had a full coverage of all our vessels. So SFA ensured that all the vessels are equipped with the VMS now. This one is completed. And uh, this was the last of my slide. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Roddy, um, for for filling us up on the on what has been happening. It's good to see that 100% uh, of the uh, same fleet is uh, has electronic monitor uh, mon an electronic monitoring system on board. 
and that you will be in due course moving to the longliners. I've seen some of this, of your um, flag state control uh, achievements. So we were just discussing Gilles and I um, as, to, as to that, of course, you know, I think, I think it was Gilles on behalf of IOTC that did this. And it seems that there's been quite some progress. So anyway, thank you very much for that, for that presentation. And now we shall move to the last presentation of this session. It is going to be done by Mr. Joseph Abiol. The presentation, this is the presentation of the ASEAN guidelines for preventing the entry of fish and fishery products from IUU fishing activities into the supply chain. Recall that yesterday when we started this process, we did say that this was, had already been done with ASEAN and um, the IORA member states wanted it to be done or wished it to be done for their region as well. So we are stepping behind this, but we, will, we would like to hear the experiences. So we are very happy to welcome Mr. Joseph Arbiol. Uh, but Mr. Mr. Arbiol, could you kindly introduce yourself beforehand because we don't have your bio. So welcome. We are happy to have you here to share your experiences and please proceed. Uh, thank you so much. I'm Joseph Arbiol. I'm a senior officer from the Food, Agriculture and Forestry Division of the ASEAN Secretariat. I'm in charge of the fishery cooperation within among the member states. Anyway, thank you so much for inviting us to this very important uh, event uh, in order to share some of our uh, initiatives as well as experience in combating IUU fishing in the region. My, let me just share my presentation perhaps. My present, oh, sorry. Yeah, my presentation will focus on the ASEAN guidelines for combating uh, for preventing the entry of fish and fishery products from the IUU fishing activities into the supply chain. I will be um, uh, focusing on the key elements of the guidelines as well as highlight some of the progress made in terms of implementation, implementing the guidelines. Sorry. Okay. IUU fishing is very high in the agenda of ASEAN. Uh, over the years, we have already several policy documents and frameworks that have been adapted in order to strengthen our regional arrangement as well as action program against IUU fishing. This includes the Joint ASEAN CIFDEC Declaration on Regional Cooperation for Combating IUU Fishing and Enhancing the Competitiveness of the ASEAN Fishery and fishery products. We also have the strategic plan of action for ASEAN cooperation on fisheries and also the cooperation on ASEAN network for combating IUU fishing. The recent uh, cooperation framework we have is the ASEAN roadmap for combating IUU fishing. These documents and frameworks uh, provide uh, the directions as well as priority actions and activities to be undertaken by ASEAN to combat IUU fishing. With regards to the ASEAN guidelines for preventing the entry of fish and fishery products from the IUU fishing activities into the supply chain, these guidelines was developed in collaboration with Southeast Asian Fishery Development Center or CIFDEC, which provided us the technical expertise in coming up with these guidelines. It was adapted by our agriculture ministers in 2015 as, and currently it's on implementation status. Uh, the, the guidelines aims to introduce strategies and appropriate measures to prevent the entry of IUU fishing 
fish and fishery products into the supply chain, provide guidance for effective fishery management, as well as promote regional cooperation in strengthening the MCS systems of fish and fishery products entering to the supply chain. The guidelines is voluntary in nature and provides uh, guidance from, from our member states to strengthen their national efforts in combating IUU fishing. It is applicable to all marine and inland catch of small scale fisheries, artisanal and including large scale fisheries fisheries. It also considers many, many forms of IUU fishing occurring in the region, uh, such as those illegal fishing within, within our member, within the jurisdiction of our member country, unauthorized transshipment and landing of fish cuts or, or fish landings across borders, poaching in the EEZ of our member states, illegal fishing and trading practices of live reef food fish, reef-based ornamentals, uh, as well as endangered aquatic species, as well as IUU fishing that are occurring within the high seas and the regional fishery management areas. The key features of the guidelines are as follows. Uh, the guidelines require member states to control fishing access through proper registration and licensing system for fishing vessels and gears, including, uh, it also promotes the use of vessel marking systems. Uh, it also encourages member states to establish systems for reporting catch, as well as compiling appropriate logbook information systems, and to implement vessel monitoring systems for all commercial fishing vessels licensed by our member states. The guidelines also encourage member states to intensify their respective surveillance during fishing operation where appropriate as well as port state control or designated landing port. It also requires member states to promote responsible fishing practices and methods, taking into account the, uh, the previous guidelines that was developed for responsible fishing operation it also encourages member states to regulate transshipment and landing of fish cuts across borders. This is through uh, establishing formal arrangement with respect to the landings be between bordering countries. It also encourages member states to conduct regular bilateral meetings to discuss mutual arrangements on licensing system, data recording, as well as sharing of information on fishery regulations. To, promote, to prevent poachings in ESZ of ASEAN member states, the guidelines also encourage member states to take appropriate actions against fishing operating illegally beyond their designated areas through flag state measurement and port state measurement, uh, implementation of port state measures. Uh, they also encourage member states to cooperate in compiling and sharing the le a list of IUU fishing vessels, as well as updating information for the regional fishing vessel uh, record. In terms of controlling illegal fishing and trading practices of live reef food fish, reef-based ornamentals, and endangered aquatic species, uh, the member states are encouraged to establish a monitoring system for live reef food fish as well as ensure that export of endangered aquatic species is avoided, uh, except for the, for the purposes of research and exper ex experiment, provided that there are uh, appropriate documents are accompanied. Uh, also, the guidelines uh, encourage member states to strengthen the implementation of port state measures, as well as implement observer program and catch documentation scheme. With regards to the progress of the guidelines, the implementation of the guidelines is done, done through the ASEAN CIFDEC strategic partnership. CIFDEC provided ASEAN with the technical support and expertise to assist in the process of implementation of these guidelines. 
At the regional level, uh, there are substantial progress have already been made, particularly in terms of establishing the regional fishing vessel record database. Uh, the database contains information about, about 6,790 fishing and carrier, car carrier vessels with 24 meters and above, above in length. Uh, it, usually the information consists of about 28 key data elements, among others, vessel name, fishing license number, and engine de details. The Asian Cuts documentation schemes has all already been developed. We are now in the process of uh, pilot testing the, the electronic catch documentation scheme, which, uh, which consists of a web-based and mo mobile applications. So this is being pilot tested in several uh, in selected Asian member countries. In terms of controlling illegal fishing uh, and trading practices of live reef food fish, uh, ASEAN has already adopted the standard operating procedure for responsible movement of live aquatic animals. These guidelines uh, also aims to facilitate responsible trade of live aquatic animals among ASEAN member countries, and as well as harmonize the health certification schemes including the quarantine uh, procedures, disease detection and diagnosis and inspection and sampling mechanism. We also conduct uh, use, uh, the ASEAN, develop the ASEAN common position on in the inclusion of commercially exploited aquatic species in the CITES appendix. On the implementation of port state measures, uh, regional activities focuses on the capacity building of ASEAN member states in terms of the implementation of port state measures for inspection and the conduct of exchange of information on legal framework as well as in inspection activities. Uh, recently, we, uh, we, we established the ASEAN network uh, on combating IUU fishing with the uh, support from the Enhanced Regional EU ASEAN Dialogue uh, Instrument Program or eReady. So they supported us in establishing this network. Uh, the aim of this network is to enhance the regional cooperation of AMS and our relevant dialogue partners in following areas setting up interactive platform for sharing of information on IUU fishing activities, developing guidelines on sharing access to and the use of IUU fishing related information, disseminating best practices to combat IUU fishing and strengthening the capacity, capability building on MCS, strengthening the communication of fishery enforcement chain. Currently, uh, Thailand serves as the ANIUU network center to host the online interactive platform, ongoing works of the ANIUU focuses on the setting up of the IT infrastructure, infrastructure for the online platform, as well as developing the guidelines on sharing access to, uh, sharing access to and the use of the IUU fishing related information. Excuse me, um, just, just a reminder. Uh, Mr. Amiel, that um, we've got five minutes. Thank yes. you very much. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we have a new project as well. This is under the ASEAN JICA Technical Cooperation. Uh, the aim of this project is to enhance the capacity of our member states in terms of uh, combating IUU fishing through the following activities. Training on responsible fishing technologies and practices. Uh, training on ASEAN CATS documentation scheme, as well as regional capacity building workshop on enhancing policies and measures against IUU fishing in Southeast Asia. Also, it, it uh, provides training for fishery inf inspector in the implementation of port state measure. I think this covers my presentation and thank you so much for listening. I uh, just would like to highlight that uh, the, 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 the report I presented here involves mainly the regional activities that conducted to support the ASEAN member states. And this does not determine 
the sub substantial this does not undermine the substantial progress made by each of our member states in implementing their respective uh, national plan of action to combat IUU fishing. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you so much, you Mr. So much. Mr. Abiel, and thank you for that. And and it's good to to see at least when when we look at from 2015 up to now, um, what you have presented um, indicates quite significant progress in in the process of, of trying to implement your guidelines or among your your countries. And also that you noted that each country, of course, have their own NPOAs and they, they proceed along that. Thank you very much. And we very much appreciate your, your presentation to this, to this workshop, because as you know, we are following in your footsteps. Now, we have reached the phase where we now have some discussions. We have had four, we have had five, we have had five presentations over this session, and this is the period when we have discussions. So before we start on the Mentimeter polling, um, we would like to open the floor up um, for any comments, any comments, suggestions, observations, uh, questions, if you have, of particular presenters. So participants, if you would like to make your intervention, you lift up your flag or you send your question in the chat box. Now, uh, while you're thinking about it, um, just to let you know that we have had a series of excellent presentations from yesterday up till today. And um, to let you know that these will be all compiled. They will be, of course, uh, handed to IORA and uh, we will be providing links so that you can have access to the entirety of the presentations that have occurred in this workshop. I know I have received several, several emails to say that, can we have presentations? I thought I'd leave it till now, but please be aware and be comforted that you can access all, you will be able to access all of the presentations you've had over the last two days. Uh, we do have, some questions. We have two questions for, for the member states. We have two questions for the member states. What results have member states observed since the implementation of measures against IUU fishing? Are they missing any tools to observe and monitor these results? And I think this comes from Olivia. Uh, to the more, uh, to the more. See, yes. So what? So people can see it in their chat box. Um, so it's it's really to to see to ask what what have members seen and what kind of tools that they are missing so that they can observe and monitor these results. And when it comes to tools, um, uh, Christine, uh, you, you presented quite a few tools, but um, uh, I hope that the person who's asked this has seen some of that. But if any of the presenters have comments on this question, you are welcome to, to uh, come in. One of the one of the questions is is based on the member states. Um, what results of the member states? Presumably, I think for the person who is asking this question, 
um, are, are the questions based on member states of IORA, or is this question related much more towards the last presentation, which relates to the member states of ASEAN? Perhaps, Olivia, you could enlighten us on this. Is it Olivia? Australia, Nicola. Anyway, uh, the, the person who asked the previous question that I repeated, could you kindly um, let us know when you talk of member states, are they of ASEAN or are they of Iowa that you're talking about? But we do have another question, and that comes from Australia. Is, it, is that right? Does Australia have a question? Uh, uh, yes, yes, thank you very much. And um, I just wanted to thank all of the, uh, the member states for, uh, for, for their presentations. Uh, although my question was for, uh, for the representative uh, from, from, uh, from ASEAN, actually. Um, I wanted to thank him for his presentation. And certainly the results from ASEAN look, uh, look, look very positive, which is, um, which is quite inspiring. So I did have two questions. So, okay, uh, my first question is, what would be the top space? Nicola, Nicholas, uh, we're having a little bit of uh, difficulty uh, hearing you. There you start with your question? How, uh, how can member states of, of VES help this implementation program? The connection is not great. Um, I've written it in the chat box, though. Questions. Okay, I have two questions from Nicholas Yates. What would be the top one to two barrier or challenges ASEAN has faced to implementation? And the second question, how can member states best help this implementation process? Thank you. Thank you, Nicholas. And the question is over to you, Mr. Ardell. Yes, uh, thank you for the questions. Yeah, for the first uh, chat, with, for the, with regards to the first questions on the challenges, uh, one challenge that we're facing, facing is that each of our member states has a uh, different capacity in terms of uh, the development of their initiatives to combat IUU. Some are in the advanced states. We have some member states who are in the advanced states already, and some are still in the the on, on you know uh, not so advanced stage uh, so so far there's this this often creates some problems in terms of uh, uh, yeah promoting implementing some of the guidelines that we based on the uh, problems in terms of promoting or implementing the some of the the provisions in the guidelines so one way we're doing it is to ensure that uh, capacity support are provided to all those members States who are still not in the advanced uh, advanced stages, as well as we do, we do have sharing of, we facilitate exchange of as well as sharing of experiences. Uh, those countries who are advanced in the advanced stage of their uh, implementation, usually they can share with the with the member states who are lagging behind. So to help them to ensure that no one is left behind. Uh, we one another problem might be on the the cost of the technology associated with the with the with the implementation of the the uh, tools. For instance, uh, you know satellite data could be expensive once you do do a tracking uh, do tracking for tracking of the IUU fishing. So this might be some areas that 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 uh, that provides or hinders some member states to implement their guy uh, their their own initiatives. But for ASEAN, we do have support. Uh, some of our di dialogue partners are helping us uh, in terms of implementing those measures that were already adopted by our ministers. 
So that way we can hopefully share not only focus the 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 capacity building to to those who are advanced level, but also to consider those who are uh, lagging behind in terms of implementation. I'm, I think I'm already uh, done with my answer. I, I'm not sure. Uh, yes, I'm already done with my answer, but I don't know if you, you were able to get it. So we do, we do uh, for, conduct capacity building activities for our member states. Uh, in some cases, we facilitate uh, those countries, especially those member states that are ahead of the implementations of the guidelines. They take lead in some of the activities uh, we have in, in terms of combating IUU. Uh, for instance, uh, the, we, when we establish the ASEAN network for combating IUU, we, we have Thailand who has taken the lead to facilitate this, this, this uh, facilitate the implementation of these guidelines. So they're providing us, uh, they, they're providing us with the IT infrastructure as well as capacity building to, to the rest of the ASEAN member states. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Abio. So as I do not see any other interventions, let us move on. But I have to... a question short. Oh, because... sorry. sorry no, One I... of our colleagues, excuse me. I was, looking, I was looking for interventions from the participants, but of course our colleagues are here as well, and they are participants. So Charlene has a question. No, I'm sorry because, uh, of course, the, the, the idea to develop those IRI guidelines came up from your guideline within the ASEAN. So, of course, we are, all have many questions for you as a representative from the ASEAN. So, I found very interesting in your presentation uh, that you had, uh, you have in, in, in the pipeline, you know, this pilot project and tested of this catch documentation scheme. And I think this is something quite interesting to know, no, Gilles? Uh, you know, if, if you have been in touch with the different RFMOs that are concerned, how would you articulate this catch documentation scheme with other existing catch documentation scheme? You know, because what we want to avoid, of course, is to have this, you know, separated catch documentation scheme, which sometimes makes uh, the administrative burden even greater for uh, the states that are involved. And so we want to make a very efficient system and kind of simplify that, right? With this super CDS, this is kind of the idea. Thank you very much. Uh, the catch documentation scheme was developed by CIFDEC. They are, they are our partners in terms of uh, technical expertise, so they are the one who developed this this system. Uh, now it's still being pilot tested. So, but the the main gist of this catch documentation scheme is it takes into account the requirements of EU in terms of uh, once you export your your product to to EU, then it's also uh, I think there's a simplified version on of this one. Uh, in terms of 
implementing the the catch documentation scheme uh, it involves uh, uh, the, the 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 catch declarations from from the fishing vessels so once it goes to the port there's also in another uh, if it goes to the to the to the processing plant then there's we call um, another uh, another certification we call it movement uh, declaration just to track all those 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 uh, the just to track the 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 supply chain so you have a, a movement declaration then from that uh, we also have once it's exported outside there's is we call the ASEAN cuts documentation scheme so the certificate so that's there's a certificate that would be issued uh, the system was also sim uh, simplified to cover uh, the small scale fisheries, for instance, some information uh, there there is uh, there is a, a simplified version for small scale fisheries. Uh, in most cases, it does not contain uh, more yes. detailed information on the, for instance, IMO registration, so IMAR sat satellite. So it doesn't require all those things. So so it's uh, a, yeah yeah that's it. Uh, the system yes. still work for both. Yeah, for the commercial and that of the small scale fisheries. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, okay, good. If we don't have any more questions, let's proceed. And we are now at this level where we will have a polling exercise. Um, we will have a polling exercise and just before, just after this polling exercise, I will let you know when we reconvene this afternoon and also what we will do. Good. The polling exercise is coming up. Here we are. Menti.com with your mobiles. Put in the code that you see up top. And the question is, do you agree with the inclusion of the cross-cutting provisions suggested below that the fishery law should provide for deterrent penalties, that legal provisions should be practical and implementable, that should consider the development and implementation of an NPOA IUU, if you haven't done so, Sufficient resources should be invested into active fishery law enforcement, which is a big issue in many regions. Join all relevant RFMOs as cooperating or full members. So that's to encourage IORA members to join all the relevant RFMOs. Reporting should become electronic where possible, seek development of an intelligence sharing mechanism between IORA members. The last is quite a, an interesting proposition and it's, it's useful to give some thought. So um, participants, please uh, um, provide your perspectives and opinions on the questions that are presented in this Mentimeter poll. I see we have 10 participants, and I would welcome some more participation and some further input. Now, while you are proceeding to populate this, let me tell you that uh, what we are, since we have run a little bit late, what we are proposing is that we will reconvene not at 13.30 this afternoon, but we will reconvene at 13.45 to allow you to uh, have a, a little uh, bit of a break for lunch. And this afternoon, I would very much encourage you to join us because it will be quite interesting. You will have the opportunity to discuss several of these matters that have come up in a smaller group in a more detailed process. 
and it will be done through group exercises and we will break out in virtual meeting rooms. So please join us at 13.45 this afternoon for the group exercises. At the moment, we have 16 uh, inputs uh, on this subject. I will give one more minute and then we shall proceed. We seem to be stuck on 17, 18. If we can make 20, that would be quite useful. Still very useful as it is because it does give us a feedback. And we can see that some are very clear legal provisions, development of NPRIUU. We see some others are scoring more at 90%. And the the, the least one is the fishery law should provide for deterrent penalties. It, it, there is general agreement, but less agreement than the others. Thanks. Okay, one more, one more. Please, let's make them one more. And we're 20. One. Okay, one more and we make 20. Okay, good. Let us proceed. Oops, we've done it. Thank you. Whoever's done that, thank you very much. You've met, we've met our objectives or met our uh, whatever it is we call our timeline. So the next question. Is there any experience relating to the practical implementation of the guidelines that we should pay particular attention to? Is there any experience? I must say I'm a little bit... Is there an experience relating to the practical implementation of the guidelines that we should pay particular attention to? Of guidelines. I, it's, I, I wouldn't read it as the guidelines, but of the guidelines of guidelines that were discussed this morning, <coughs> on, or whether there are particular you know, lessons that we should... You know, okay, okay. Let us clarify that. Is there any experience relating to the practical implementation of the guidelines that we are preparing, that we have started on the process of preparing any experience that we should pay particular attention to. We have 11, which, which starts to quickly suggest that there are, there is experience we need to take. And this afternoon in the discussion group, we can start on that process. Um, but we will take the feedback and we will continue uh, and recognize this and, and adapt it and incorporate it in the, in the roadmap to the, to, the, the, to the guidelines. Thank you. This is quite clear. So the next one, yes, we got one no. That's good. It shows that this is proper data. It's not cooked. Um, if yes... Okay, if yes, do we need to be mindful? What do we need? So for, for those that say, have said that we, there is practical experience that we need to be mindful for all, what is that? And this, I believe, Serge, is, uh, is an open. This question is at your liberty to fill over the next period up until... We start in the afternoon, and as I said, we start in the afternoon at 13.45. So um, do catch a break, do get some lunch or whatever it is, wherever you are in the Indian Ocean, but you can continue to put your input into this one for the next 45 plus, almost next hour. So thank you very much, all participants, for this morning's session. We have had some several very interesting um, and stimulating presentations. Thank you very much. Believe you me, it'll be even more interesting this afternoon. So we look forward to seeing you at 13.45 this afternoon, Iora, Iora time, which is pretty well almost one hour from now. So thank you very much and have a nice break or lunch.
Thank Good you. day. Thank you. <clears throat> um, good afternoon, uh, participants, and thank you for your patience. Sorry, uh, we had a few minor technical difficulties. Um, we are actually operating this workshop from several areas. Um, it was supposed to be in Réunion, but we're in Paris, and there's a, a number of links that are coming in from different places. So we had some minor technical difficulties, and now we are back into action. Thank you very much for joining us for this, what will be a very interesting session this afternoon, um, and of the workshop moving towards the development of an, an adoption of IOR guidelines to prevent entry of IUU fisheries products in the IOR member state supply chains. Now, next, could we have a slide, please? Yes. So, what we shall be doing now is we will be breaking out into five groups. They're brainstorming groups, but discussion groups as well. And it, it, it's a synthesis, synthesis of the discussions. <clears throat> it is largely based on the presentations that have been made, but also of the input that we have received from the Mentimeter. If you remember throughout, you have been sending in inputs. These have been collated. <clears throat> and the five groups are broken as follows. So there'll be se five separate virtual meeting rooms. The five groups are looking at the scope, the principles, and the cross-cutting responsibilities of the guidelines. And this will be moderated by Kristin von Kistarski. The next group is on flag state responsibilities. And unfortunately, something cropped up and Duncan could not uh, join us, but we are very pleased and happy to have the services of Charlie Gilko. Charlie, many thanks for accepting at short notice. We appreciate it very much. So the flag state responsibilities will be done by Charlie Gilko. Port states' re responsibilities will be led by Charlene Godet. I shall lead the coastal state responsibilities, and the market state responsibilities will be led by Gilles. So what will happen? Can we have the next slide? Yes. No, because he's... So... What will happen? You can break out in those five groups using that button. And on the screen, you will see at the bottom how you do that. So if you, if you press that button or click, divide divise en groupe or divide into groups. So at the bottom of your screen, you will see this image, divise en groupes, divide into groups. If you click that, you will have the choice of which group to join. And it'll take a few minutes, maybe five or so minutes. On the other side will be the moderators and leaders, etc. They will be there, they will see you coming in, and they will be they will be uh, starting when when they uh, there are sufficient numbers or a few members. Okay. Now, except one group, and that's the group that I lead, um, you don't need to divide into that group because the coastal state group will be done from the main, from, from, no? Are they also looking into the coastal state? Oh, oh, okay. <clears throat> Little 
technical advice. We, we need the gurus. The, <laughs> the coastal states will also, as you divide into groups, you will see the coastal state group. So as you divide into groups, you'll see those five groups that I mentioned. And then you choose the group that you want and you enter it. So we start now the groups. Um, so please, um, if there are any questions or, uh, or and clarities, if you haven't done this before, but it's a simple process. If you do have any real issues, send an email uh, in the chat box and we shall address it. But meanwhile, what we can do, so if you are stuck in the main, in the main group, in the main plenary, let's say, and you are having problems, you just send something in the chat box and we will respond to it. So with that, we will now break into groups. And on the other side, the, the leaders and the moderators will explain to you what will be done and you can discuss it. Um, you can decide within the group whether this is presented by the moderator or whether there'd be somebody who would like, who would be prepared to do the presentation at the end. Um, we will proceed along those lines and then in, uh, in we have allowed for this group exercise, we have allowed 45 minutes. So 45 minutes after we start. So that's four, uh, 45 minutes after we start, we will then convene, get back into the main plenary and each, each, uh, uh, each group will uh, present what they have discussed and what they are proposing. So with that, with those uh, uh, guidances, with those guidelines, let us say, um, please, you are invited to click at the bottom and move into one of the groups of your choosing. Thank you very much. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, um, my group was not populated, so the other groups were more interesting. So this is why I cannot present any conclusions um, and I won't take too much of your time. What I have done is that I summarized the contributions that had come out of the, um, the Mentimeter. And I think that is quite interesting to say that if it is uh, generally on the cross-cutting issues, what one should be mindful about is um, can be summarized in about six points, and that was legal framework, monitoring, analysis, information sharing, and transparency. That complex was mentioned uh, four times, so that was one of the issues that participants felt uh, should be uh, considered as a cross-cutting issue. Then the accessibility and usability of data, uh, referring very much to electronic systems, capacity development, best practice, learnings, of course, from the experience from ASEAN, raising awareness and communication, and then also measuring progress in terms of implementation. So these were points that had been mentioned uh, by the participants. And on the scope and principles, uh, I only had guiding questions and we didn't come to any conclusions because we did not have discussions. So this is all from group one. Um, so we, we ran through uh, the ones which were sort of set up at, um, prior to the meeting, the ones that came up at the Mentimeter, um, and a few more came up um, regarding the sort of flag state responsibility in terms of uh, stopping IEU activity entering the supply chains in IORA countries. Um, so 
the I think that there was not really any comment just full support um, as was done on the voting for vessel registration and co and concession of fishing license should be linked. So there, there's that I think is a, 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 a all, all around agreed on and supported. Um, so the, the, the next one, there's an interesting point re, um, regarding this one, which uh, which is considered not flagging vessels that were not fished in the national EEZ. Um, this was summarised as um, generally supported, but th there is some concerns that were mentioned regarding the potential impact on domestic coastal fisheries if industrial vessels that were um, designed to be fishing in, di in distance water fisheries um, are required to come to fish in the national fish fishery. That might have some um, additional um, uh, conflict. Um, avoid flagging vessels with an IU history was supported. Instead of ratifying the FAA compliance and UN fish stocks agreement was generally, generally supported um, as it was in the, in the voting. The global record that was generally supported. There was uh, a note that as it's voluntary, not all states are able to do it. So if it could be um, either strengthened to be uh, a requirement or it, or, it, um, or, or there's somewhere else to build a legal framework around doing this, um, for, linked for IORA countries, that would make it easier to um, for some states to um, do, adopt. Um, and another, another similar one that came up in the recommendations was a regularly published list of authorised vessels, both in EZ and, and those authorised to fish in the ABNJ. Um, it was identified that there, there will be some overlap if you were doing the global record or with what's reported to um, RFMOs, but if, if, if the right system was set up for this um, and the right legal framework was there, then, um, or the process was there, then that could, this could be beneficial. Um, so, so in principle, um, with a few caveats, that was supported. Landing controls and reporting. Um, so this was a suggestion made. There was a clarification that um, when the word, the word controls um, for landings, for uh, domestic domestic vessels should be considered um, around uh, inspection and monitoring of those vessels and not um, refusing entry like PSMA because for domestic vessels that's not not possible. Uh, managing the use of AIS that was actually supported in the group, um, so we kept that in here. Uh, set legal framework on data sharing and transparency of fishers operating in the region. Um, so the, in the suggestion, this was sort of set the agenda, but um, it was suggested that this could be a recommendation that there is a, a legal framework on data sharing and transparency is developed for the region. This was a suggestion, so we left it in here. Um, it would probably need to be wider consideration from the group um, for it to remain, but it's something to be considered. Um, there was a suggestion for uh, working towards having unregulated high seas resources for under RFMO management. That was all round supported. Um, IMO numbers, so this, wh whether or not this is strengthened or not, um, could be discussed. But the inclusion of IMO, IMO numbers as being part of the recommendations, um, whether it's a requirement or whether it's um, a suggestion, then that, that can be discussed, but that was generally supported. Um, and members that comply with um, fishing gear restrictions set by RFMOs, particularly with IOTC in regards to drift nets. Um, this could this was suggested as a, an important um, area to be covered by the by by the guidelines. Um, and finally, uh, we touched on sort of the collaboration around stock assessment, uh, particularly for transboundary species. Um, uh, squid came up as an example. Uh, but there's lots of other examples. Um, IOTC obviously covers some of this, um, and, uh, and and so RFMOs will be covering it to some degree. But there's there are potentially gaps in that. So the guidelines could look at how to encourage that collaboration on fish stocks assessments. That's that's the end of that's all the ones we got through. Thank you very much, Charlie. Thanks for that. It was.
We shall now move on to the next group, and this is the port state group. Um, please, um, will the rapporteur please? Uh, yes, the port state measures there. Yeah, that's right, Charlene. Please. Uh, Thank you very much. Can everyone hear me? Yes. 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 Okay, great. I'm very much multitasking here, so yes, uh, I was already preparing the, this the workshop closing. So anyway, so I had some problems at the beginning uh, with uh, yeah technology. This is uh, the, the the little issue with uh, those working uh, group and and Zoom meeting. So, but at the end, I had very constructive and interesting discussion with uh, a representative from Somalia, from the Department of Fisheries, from the private sector and representing the fisheries industry in Iran, and uh, also uh, from Mozambique, someone from the Department of Fisheries, and from Thailand. So maybe I will share my screen to show uh, the conclusion of our working group so let me see and tell me if you can see can everyone see it yeah. yes you can see the conclusion so unfortunately i mean the 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 the, the conclusion from uh, the metimeter i mean the, the the you know the running question we gave where we were waiting for the the contribution, there was nothing very, very substantial. Unfortunately, we didn't have as much as idea than other group. So there was something about limiting economic incentive, which is provision from the International Plan of Action of IEU under the port state uh, section. And also that MCS regional cooperation, uh, we should have MCS regional cooperation guideline. So in our group, we had discussion. Uh, Somalia presented uh, its current MCS system and status regarding the PSMA implementation because Somalia is uh, as ratified the, the, the PSMA agreement. So it was very interesting to have uh, information and idea about their experience with implementing the PSMA and how they see that we could fight IEU fishing in the uh, IORA region thanks to uh, the PSM, uh, thanks to the PSMA. Uh, Iran also had uh, shared interesting uh, thought about the PSMA. They indicated that even if they have not ratified yet uh, the, the port state measure agreement, Iran is a IOTC uh, CPC, which means that they are implementing the uh, resolution of, uh, of IOTC on port state measure, which is the 1611. So they have to comply with uh, port state measure, even if they are not a party to the FAO port state uh, measure agreement. Uh, Thailand also was giving uh, its opinion on the PSMA implementation. And basically what was the idea that came out are listed here under this uh, PowerPoint slide. So I don't think I need to put it in slideshow. You can see it well. Or should I put it in slideshow? It's okay. Yes, in slideshow. Yeah, I put it now. You can see. Uh, so one of the conclusion was that uh, we should reflect the key provision from the FAO, PSMA, and RFMO resolution uh, in the section under PSMA in the guideline. Uh, so this is what was uh, presented uh, more or less in in the roadmap. So to have designated port to have those ports uh, with sufficient capacity to undertake inspection, to have a system of prior authorization of the cell to come into the port and to prohibit use of port, any use uh, to the cell that are suspected of IEU fishing and to have uh, provision on inspection. No? So the other uh, conclusion was that maybe we should consider having in the guideline uh, a regional operational, regional operational standard for port state measure at the IRR level. This was actually uh, one of the proposals in Seychelles uh, answer to the questionnaire that we circulated them on PSM when I did uh, my report. We could also have communication scheme for collaboration and exchange of information, because as we have seen, 
exchange of information among the member states in the region is very important to fight IU fishing. Importance of regional cooperation among port state, flag state, coastal state. So this was very much emphasized by Somalia and Thailand. There is no fighting IU fishing without cooperation at global and uh, regional level among all states. So the importance of setting a regional network of port, but also custom authority, because this is not always just about authority. Custom can play a very important role in checking the document like catch certification scheme in the port, especially when we talk about import of product. Uh, that an important point that was mentioned by Iran is that the, the guidelines should be voluntary and not binding. And this actually uh, would not be under port state, but more under what Kirsten was doing, meaning uh, the scope and the principle of the guideline. And I think that all the member states would agree on this approach to go for voluntary guideline and not binding. And then, of course, uh, the importance to have a global and regional debate, but also action on IEU as it cannot be eradicated without close cooperation among IORA member states. And this was as well something that was uh, very much stressed by Somalia. So we also stress the importance of PSM as a tool to prevent entry of IEU fishing product entering into the market of IORA uh, member states. And then I cannot see the last because I have the, the Zoom so I have to it's consider including Thank an you. <laughs> ah, yes. in accent the key RFMO resolutions applying to IO yes. members. That state. was a suggestion of Thailand, yes. And we were discussing because what I was stressing is that the uh, RFMO's resolution on PSM from COFA, from CCSBT, from IUTC, which concern especially the IORA member states, they are uh, more or less a copy paste of the FAO PSMA with an interesting added provision, which is the need to meet the 5% threshold for monitoring entire transshipment and lending. Thank you. That's it for me. Thank you, Charlene, and thank you, the uh, Port State Group, for your contributions. Obviously, quite a bit of discussion. The next one is the Coastal State Group, which I, I led. Uh, we had a vigorous discussion. We had up to six or seven members. And um, what we've done is we um, wordsmithed some of the proposals. And so I will ask... Um, uh, Rodney Halisop, who has kindly agreed to um, present the this um, the results of this work group from uh, from this afternoon. So Rodney, our Rod, not okay, Rodney. 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 <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um. Uh, the uh, coastal Rodney. working group. Uh, yeah. The uh, coastal working group. Um. Uh, draw um discuss on a few points bullet points and the first one uh, we discussed about the commercial fleets should be monitored remotely by all able fisheries monitoring center and uh, developing coastal state should be assisted in this task uh, the second one was about licenses should not be issued in the EZ of coastal state to foreign fishing vessel unless it can be effectively monitored by coastal state Focus on domestic fleet to reduce IUU fishing. Threaten the capacity building to develop legal framework to assist MCS and reduce IUU. And then the government should uh, enforce the prevention of the landing of illegal fish into the, its country. And then we have other ideas in the bullet point as well. Um, uh, coastal state MCS regulation or effective VMS system. Capacity building, knowledge, and human resource sharing. Encourage state to be part of multilateral agreement to uh, for data sharing uh, against IUU fishing. And then uh, we had uh, AIS and uh, VMS should be mandated for licensed fishing vessels above 18 meters. Strong cooperation with relevant organizations such as IUTC and other IFMOs for control of IUU fishing. Use of advanced technical instruments may be encouraged, example, the CLS or other, any other platforms. 
and uh, must be aligned must be aligned with the uh, SEO IPO, IPO IUU and uh, other instrument that address coastal state encourage the, the coastal state to identify a common international body to regulate track and report on the progress of eliminating all IUU fishing thank you Thank you, thank you very much, Wadi, for that. And that was the the contribution of the Coastal State Group. Um, next, we have um, the input of the Market State Group. Just back on time. Just okay. back on time. Just back on time. Very good. You can leave that on. Um, uh, so um, we went over. You know that in the uh, in the guidelines we only had a single suggested provision. So I will start uh, with that one. That was to develop mandatory post landing traceability mechanisms for fish products, and um, it was proposed that we would narrow that one down. You don't want to. No, 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 not at all. We decided that we were going to narrow that one down um, to uh, trade. <clears throat> so it now reads develop mandatory post landing traceability mechanisms or framework for fish products entering international trade. <clears throat> one that is very closely related to that one is to ensure mapping of supply chains that contribute fisheries products to uh, international trade, including the identification of supply chain related critical tracking events and implementation of critical data elements. The next one, uh, states should consider supporting multilateral CDS for resources in which they have a direct stake and which are traded internationally. Of course, realizing that catch documentation schemes only have a, uh, a role to play in fisheries products that are traded. If they're not traded, catch documentation schemes don't make sense. States should consider supporting catch documentation schemes that are covering species throughout their range of distribution. And this is one of the, uh, one of the points that had been discussed yesterday. And that was uh, picked up by the group. <clears throat> States should encourage uh, the use of existing eCDS platforms where in existence and where their extend, expanded use would be feasible. And this relates to the point uh, that came out of Todd Dubois' presentation uh, yesterday uh, from Kemla, and uh, which does seem to make an awful lot of sense. Make it an offense to knowingly import IUU fisheries products is another one. That's a very simple idea, but it's one that we uh, very often do not find in uh, fisheries legislation, even though it seems intuitively uh, correct to think that that would be the right way to go. So that is a point uh, that was added uh, to the list of points um, that came out of our group and favor electronic CDS over paper-based versions. I believe that is also a point that came directly out of the discussions that we had. Um, and then I have Two more, uh, ensure proper capacity building for supply chain inspectors, ensuring enforcement of traceability rules. Um, so there is a, um, a sort of a feeling that um, in countries where traceability is not uh, written with a capital T at the moment, that the capacity to um, implement and enforce uh, traceability rules might not be <coughs> given as yet. So capacity building uh, will be one of the things that will be of importance, making sure that the rules that we put in place will also be enforced. And finally, ensure alignment and coordination between food, food and health and fisheries inspection course. And this final point um, is, relates to a phenomenon uh, that we find in um, in fisheries law enforcement, fisheries law enforcement generally finishes in the port and at the landing, at, 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 the, uh, at the moment of landing. And then when fisheries products 
move into the country, into, into processing and into export, fisheries inspectors are typically not present anymore. And the inspection that is then taking place, taking place is generally executed by uh, inspectorates that we often refer to as the veterinary services and that are more concerned with, um, with food security uh, than with uh, legality of fisheries products. And in, in that domain, we, we need a similar alignment as we need between vessel registration and licensing of fishing vessels. We also need an alignment between those that do inspection for uh, traceability and inspection for legality and those that do traceability and inspection for food security. And those are the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine points that have come out of our group. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Gilles. And uh, thanks to all the members, all the five groups, and all the members that participated in these group discussions and came up with these results. Now, um, before proceeding further, uh, I think what we have on our agenda is, so we've reported, we, before going to this agenda item, I would still leave it open. Um, I would still leave it open just for anybody that has any comments in terms of the, 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 any further additions that members may wish to make on these uh, outcomes that we have heard from the group exercises. Are there any any uh, participants that would like to make some comments since we did this in different groups? Um, one group may wish to have a comment on another group's outcome. Um, is there anybody, uh, any of the participants would like to add something further to what has been uh, presented by the groups? And you can lift your hand or you can um, Lift your hand and take the floor or send a message in the chat box. Do we have any input? Do we have any input? No. So, okay, thank you. So it seems that it seems that the five groups and their outcomes pretty well captured captured all the expressions that um, the different participants wanted to make. What would the intersection is? Well, this, this, we will, this we will cover a little later. That's the way forward. And I will speak a little bit about this. Eh? So right now, we are, we are looking at this outcome. I'll talk a little bit about intersectionally what will happen. OK, any other, any other? Now we're looking at inputs towards the outcomes that the groups found. Okay, thank you, thank you. It seems everything is okay. Um, that being the case, that being the case, um, can we have a poll? Huh? What we will be doing now is polling uh, on the outcomes of the workshop for the last two days. So it's for you to give a poll. Later on after this, I will um, provide a little bit of an overall of the workshop. I will go through the next steps uh, according to how we have agreed in when it was placed, the, agreed on the word on the roadmap, and then we will have the closure. So first, first now we're looking for a breakout call. We're looking at um, some input, if there's any significant inspiration that you would draw from the group exercise and discussion. Was there any significant inspiration that you would draw, draw from the group exercise and discussion? We have a few minutes. But uh, Serge, I thought this was really on, on polling of the, this workshop. No? That's coming. All right, and that's next. Okay. Please, any significant inspiration that you draw from the group exercise and discussion? Uh, 
Okay. Since we are, uh, I'll give them a minute for for any other inspiration. Um, what I am seeing at the moment, what I am seeing in the moment, it says capacity buildings, and what I think is the inspiration which is being being uh, expressed is that there is a need for a lot of capacity building um, to be flagged in the gu guidelines. Uh, I think time and time again, we have heard that, yes, but there are significant differences between different IO members. So there's also, as part of this guideline, we must think of this significant capacity building that will be needed. Physical meetings for next steps, I will cover that. Plenty of scope to make the guideline fit for purpose for IORA member states. Thank you for that. Will the, um, as you will see, as you will see when I cover the, um, when I cover the process, there will be plenty of scope to make the guidelines fit for purpose for the IOR member states. Huh? Because this is just the start of the process. Remember, when we covered it, for those that may have not have been there yesterday, this is just the start of the process. And next, squid issues, which could be considered as critical issues for global ocean ecosystem sustainability. Um, I'll leave how, how we include squid issues. I think this relates to the issue that there are big gaps in RFMO mandate in the Indian Ocean. I'm not really quite sure, but it's, it's a good observation. I'm not so quite, really quite sure how the guidelines can address that, but it is a, a, it's a, a comment that we will take on board. Can there I, is can I can I yes could please. I make a, a short comment to that could one? You, I you know um, <clears throat> the uh, it, it's just um, an idea that struck me uh, while we were sitting in the working groups and we discussed the squid in the in the market state group and it doesn't really fit into the market state group because it's currently an unregulated fishery and so the market state is you know at, at the far end of, of of where the action is currently needed. The action is needed uh, in, in, in the domain of, of, of actually uh, regulating the access to the resource and then regulating uh, the, 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 the harvest. Mm -hmm. And you know that in the, um, so currently it's happening in, in, in high seas pockets um, that are also not subjected to an RFMO. And in the Western uh, Pacific, they actually managed to close the high seas pockets uh, to foreign fishing vessels by making it conditional uh, to a license to fish within the EEZ. Oh, yeah. And so we, we do have a precedent on something. It's not exactly the same, but it's, it's, it's a similar dynamic. And it is something that could be considered. I mean, the Coastal State Working Group, which is mentioned there, this mechanism is something that could be considered in order to start regulating that uh, squid fishery, even in the absence of... Um, it's something to be explored. Okay. So let's put it that way. Thank you. Thank you, Gilles, for that. Thank you. Since this is a bit of an end play, there are possibilities. If the coastal states are strong in terms of their regulation of their own EEZs, these vessels will not be able to get in that region. I think that's what you're saying. That there is strong support for these guidelines. This is, this is a, a, a nice comment. The guidelines should also look at what minimum what is minimum so that there is progress in spite of being... Of not being mandatory. <laughs> I'm sorry, of not being mandatory. <coughs> I'm sorry. The guidelines should also look at what is minimum. So it's really minimum terms and conditions. Anyway, it's good for the drafters of the guidelines to take this into consideration. Coastal State Working Group. Oh, okay, good. I like this. It says that the Coastal State Working Group drew significant inspiration. So um, I'm pleased. It was, it was quite a robust discussion, so that's good. Multilateral efforts to coordinate and communicate on IUU 
will require extraordinary digital infrastructure coupled with increased human capacity to use it. Noted. The guideline, yes. So these are some of the significant inspirations that we have. Thank you very much for those that, that provided it. Next, Mentimeter, please. There was one last one just up here. here. The, oh, that just came up. The importance of catch documentation schemes and how it helps to combat. Okay, so what it is saying is that within the guidelines, we should, we should highlight the importance of CDS schemes for combating IU. Thank you very much for that. So let us proceed to the next one. These are the feedback questions. These are the feedback questions for the workshop. Oh, yes. So now we want you to score the workshop. This is a score of the workshop. There's also the one there on the Yes. This is a score of the workshop and see your participation. Please proceed. So the first, the first question that we are asking, we need a poll, is did you attend both days of the workshop? So we just want to know to what extent those that, that attended the first day of the workshop uh, also attended the second or did not. So there are 11 said, yes, we attended both days of the workshop, but we have a significant number that has not, has not replied. I'm sure there are some members that did not attend both days of the workshop. So it'd be good to, good to have a, an input in this. It would be good to have an input in this. I will give a few more. Uh, I'll give uh, a minute or less. We have 16. Can we have a bit more input? Could you kindly go to menti, www.menti.com and use the code that is there? We would uh, much appreciate an input on this one, as indeed two other questions. It will be very quick especially if you get onto menti.com and uh, provide an input. Okay, well, next one, please. Can we have the next one? Here we are, place a pin on your country. Uh, Serge, um, okay, good. Just place a pin on your country uh, if you attended the workshop. Yes, that's another way of scoring where the participation came from. I'm seeing quite a lot from Thailand, and yes, in India. Come on, guys, let's see where your participation was coming from. Lots of Thailand. Oh, good, we have somebody in the Mediterranean. That's very good. That's Tunisia. It's Tunisia, is it? Oh, we've got the Seychelles is there. Come on. We can uh, provide some input. Thailand is scoring quite high. It has scored throughout anyway. Seychelles too. Seychelles has two as well. Like please, a soccer game, huh? please. This is like, yeah, it seems like a little bit of a soccer game. <laughs> oh, we have two from outside the region, uh, up in the, in the Mediterranean. That's, that's good. Australia is in there. Australia is in there. Um, who else? Oh, interesting. Interesting. This is Japan. Am I yeah. correct? Yes, yes. We have somebody from Japan. That's good. Let's have a few more contributions. How about France? Hey. Ah, I'm sure. Five. Yes. Please, can we have uh, some more? Um, anyway, this is this is this is good to see. Oh, uh, we've got somebody from Sumatra. Is that Sumatra? Where? There's a, there's a there's a black dot up north. Um, it's either Yemen, could be Yemen. You see the yellow dot? Uh, yeah, no, yes. the blue dot. The blue, the blue dot in the um, middle of the um, north yes. in west, right? Yes, yes. I thought, blue dot. I thought it was Maldives. No, no, Maldives. It is, it's, no it's, it's not Maldives. It's more like, yeah, it's well, it, 
Sumatra is not a member of the I.O., so I don't know how. Uh, it would be Yemen. Yemen is Yemen is uh, is a member of of Iora and Sumatra, or oh, Socotra, Socotra, not Sumatra, Socotra. Yes, we've got Mauritius, and I Madagascar. think now we got Madagascar, <laughs> Réunion. It's, it's Réunion, it's La Réunion, it's France. So we got three from France as well. That's good. Um, Good. We have to move on. Thank you very much. Next one, please. So this one is a, an assessment of the speakers of the workshop, the information, the animation, presentation slides. How did it compare to your expectations, etc. Overall evaluation of the workshop. So um, I have a few more persons. It would be good to have. 20 participants, that would be a, a nice 18. Good, we're getting there. Going, going, come on, it's an auction. 20, we have done it. That's uh, uh, at least half of the, wonderful, wonderful. 20, we have made it. Uh, if anybody is going to do a little extra one. Okay, anyway, thank you very much uh, for this feedback. And uh, can we have the 21? Very good. Okay. Can we? 22. Let's go. That's good. And I think going, going, gone. Let's move on. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. So thank you very much for this. It now comes to the time we have what is called a break on the, on the program, but it is not a break because we have been running behind. So what I will do now is uh, give a little bit of the uh, synthesis, synthesis. I'm not going to give a synthesis of the discussion because you have seen that and you also just had the feedback from the groups. But just a little bit overall, we have been working fairly strongly, fairly tightly over the last two days. We have had an excellent opening, a very good day. Lots of good presentations, some 20 or so specialists. We have had contributions from the different um, countries of the Iowa region. And so we have had uh, uh, quite a good day. Two points that we would like, I would like to make. Firstly, that all the contributions that you have made today, particularly in the work groups, will be taken up and they will be incorporated in a workshop report. As, as I mentioned before, um, there'll be a workshop report. As I mentioned before, all the presentations made over the last two days, all the presentations made over the last two days, put, put, the, put the whole thing up, please. <laughs> Can they see us? Yes. Okay, they can see us. Yeah. Okay, thank you, sorry. All the, all the uh, presentations made over the last two days um, will be uh, packaged and you can access them on, on a link. Now, the, the way forward, and which was discussed and, and uh, accepted early on in the workshop. So this is the workshop of senior officials, debates and recommendations. It will lead to the updating, it will lead to a report, as I have mentioned, and then the updating of the roadmap and guideline elements based on the feedback that you have received. Now, this will then be passed through through the IORA Secretariat so that we receive feedback on the roadmap and the guideline elements. So this will be sent through to the member states for feedback on the roadmap and the guideline elements. Based on that feedback from the member states, the roadmap and the guidelines will be drafted in the next phase so 
The comments will be taken and the further draft will be provided of the guidelines. The receiving feedback on the draft guidelines. These draft guidelines will be sent to the member countries via the IOWA Secretariat and we will seek to have the feedback on the draft guidelines and preparation of a second draft. The second draft will then go to a validation workshop, presenting of the guidelines, debates, and recommendations. So that means for those that have any, um, have brought up this issue that it needs to go through. Remember that this, there will be the next, a whole process working through the IO Secretariat until we have another workshop that validates the presentation of the guidelines, and then there will be debate and recommendations from that workshop. It will then go to through the IORA Secretariat. It will go to the Committee of Senior Officials for their endorsement, and then it will go to the the um, Committee of the Ministerial Committee of the IORA for final approbation and endorsement. So that is the process which will take place. <laughs> on that note, on that note, and before um, proceeding to the workshop closure, I would like to thank, I would like to thank um, the, the key movers in, in this process, and that's the IORA Secretariat for the support throughout and their work with, with uh, this uh, team of technical assistance. So we'd like to, to thank the IORA Secretariat. And we would like to thank, of course, the, the uh, IORA member who has moved this, and that is France, that has moved this process through the Secretariat and the cluster group for fisheries management. We would like also to thank the Agence France pour le développement, who are overseeing the entirety of this technical assistance to IPOLA, and last but not least, Kofa Pesh, who provided the technical aspects and the technical aspects to assistance that we provided. So thank you very much for this. And now I shall pass the, the floor to, for the closing remarks. And first, I would, uh, I would invite um, uh, Ambassador His Excellency Marcel Escu, um, Ambassador Delegué à la Coopération Régionale uh, the Sierra Indian for his final words uh, in the closing of this workshop. Um, Son Excellence. Uh, Merci beaucoup. Question. Can you hear me? Yes. Nous pouvons, oui. Yeah. Good afternoon, dear participants. It's my great pleasure to address all of you after this Blue Economy Workshop on IEO fishing held virtually in La Réunion, France. This subject, moving towards development and adoption of IOA guidelines to prevent entry of IEO fishery products into IOA member states supply chains, is a very strategic issue for all of us, especially for France, and we are considering this initiative and this event since our mission to Iowa. May I take this opportunity to thank again all member states for this decision taken by consensus in December 2020 to admit France, which is the latest member of Iowa since January 2021. For us, this Admission to Iowa is a development of our Indo-Pacific strategy, especially relevant is the case of France. France is a country with more than one and a half million 
of fellow citizens in its territories in the Southern Pacific and Indian Ocean, plus hundreds of thousands of expats around the oceans in Africa, Middle East, and Asia. We are very proud to organize this first French event since this admission. It's a first experience, so we ask for your comprehension for some technical issues maybe, and of course we hope to have another opportunity in the next future to host a real event in La Réunion with all of you to make you discover this uh, fantastic island and this region. This event is also a part of our commitment to the Indo-Pacific Oceans Initiative. IPOI. IPOI was launched by the Indian Prime Minister during the 14th East Asia Summit in Bangkok in November 2019. This initiative covers seven pillars of collective and coordinated action. Maritime ecology, maritime security, marine resource, capacity building and resource sharing, disaster risk reduction and management, science, technology, and academic cooperation, and trade, connectivity, and maritime transport. In April 2021, the French Foreign Minister, Mr. Jean-Yves Le Drian, announced during his visit to India that France will participate in the IPOI to play a leading role on marine resource pillar. Our commitment within Iowa is part of this framework. This challenge of fighting IO fishing is key in our strategy for blue economy in the Indian Ocean and was especially relevant during our period of chairmanship of IOC Indian Ocean Commission from 2020. 2022. Uh, the French chairman of the IOC was a good opportunity to work on economics, on maritime securities, on mobility of students, and the modernization of IOC. We are especially proud of the initiative of Iowa and IOC to come to the Memorandum of Understanding in February during the last ministerial meeting under French chairmanship held in Paris the 23rd of February with the presence of the new Secretary General of Iowa. And now we have the two organizations will go together, especially on the economic and this brand of challenge. May I mention too that during our chairmanship uh, we visited the headquarters of African Union, which is now developing a strategy for blue economy. And we are sure that under the new chairmanship, Madagascar, IOC and African Union will develop a close partnership on blue economy for the common purpose. May I ask, especially thank AFD and Cofrepesh for their support for their commitment. May I thank the Réunionist expert, les amis de la Réunion. Je disais que nous espérions bientôt pouvoir accueillir un événement avec vous à la Réunion. La Réunion is a focus of excellence in science, in research on maritime environment, on biodiversity. And we are sure that la Réunion will contribute a lot to the work by IOC and IOA in the future. Your conclusions from yesterday and today will be quite valuable for of us in this work. We are committed with many state members for IOA guidelines to be adopted by the next ministerial council. And we had opportunities to discuss that with the new secretary general and with the director for blue economy which was last year the acting secretary general of Anna, Iowa, and we shortlisted to him in a couple of minutes. 
those constitutions are key today because we cannot work just as government between themselves. We need the support of the scientists, the support of the university, of research, of private sector, of fisheries, of course. We must all work together for a better future. And now let us go forward with Iowa in 2022 to the guidelines, to the implementation and this new contribution by Iowa to the work of all international relevant organizations, either global as a regional. May I just reiterate the commitment of France for a stable, peaceful, prosperous and open Indian Ocean in the frame of Indo-Pacific. You can rely on the French commitment to achieve this goal, eliminate IU fishing in the Indian Ocean. And Iowa guidelines will be an important contribution to this objective for common interest for all our people and for mankind. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador Askura, for those words. And finally, uh, may I invite or, uh, the, the um, Dr. Gatot Gunawan, who is the Director of Blue Economy in the Indian Ocean Rim Association Secretariat. Dr. Gunawan, kindly your words and closing of this workshop. Thank you. Thank you, Aubrey. Excellency, Ambassador Eskir, distinguished participants and colleagues, I would like to thank you all for attending the virtual workshop entitled Moving Toward the Development and Adoption of IURA Guidelines to Prevent Entry of IUU Fisheries Product within IURA Member States Supply Chains. I wish to extend my deep appreciation and gratitude to the organizers, France, AFD, and Copper Press for the excellent arrangement made and for taking the lead in addressing the important issue of IU fishing in IORA. I must admit that the workshop was successful in meeting its objective set and I must thank the expert for the insightful presentation and for the sharing their experiences with the IORA member states during this two days workshop. Colleagues, I also wish to thank for your active participation during the meeting, including in the Mentimeter survey and for providing inputs on the areas and topics to be included in the IRA guidelines on IU fishing. Earlier, Mr. Harris has mentioned the next step for finalization of the guidelines. Thank you, Aubrey, for that. And I understand that the, this is quite a challenging process but I rely on the cooperation and continued support of the IRA member states to develop the IUU guidelines for the benefit of the IRA region. Before concluding, I would like to thank once again France, AFD, and Coverpesh for organizing this event for their active role in, in implementing and carrying our project under the France IURA MOU and for their continued support to IURA. I understand that it is the first meeting that hosted by France since France became the IURA member state in 2020, in 2020. And I hope also further French leadership in finalization of these guidelines. I look forward to your continued support toward developing the IURA IUU guideline and hope to see you again in the next workshop. Thank you.